session is titled Homelessness, COVID and Inequality. And I'd like to welcome our three speakers, <clears throat> Neve O'Rourke uh, from St. James's Hospital, Dr. Paula Mayock uh, from Trinity College, and Joe Finnerty from University College Cork and, and Maura Buckley, who's, uh, who's joining him. Sorry, Margaret Buckley, who's joining him. So really big welcome to our speakers. Um, we have a lot to talk about and only an hour to do it in. So we will be stri sticking strictly to time and I will give people um, a little bit of notice uh, if they're beginning to go over their time allocated. Um, our first speaker is Neve O'Rourke and as Neve is getting her slides ready, I'll, I'll just give you a brief introduction uh, to Neve. Um, <clears throat> Neve is a senior social worker uh, who's based on the inclusion health team at St. James's Hospital in Dublin. And the inclusion team is dedicated to improving access to specialist hospital care for socially excluded individuals through trauma-informed integrated care, advocacy, education and research. Neve's own social work career has spanned voluntary and statutory agencies in child welfare, paediatrics, emergency medicine <clears throat> and inclusion health. She has a passion for the integration of trauma-informed care and is a strong advocate for developing the potential of persons who have experienced adversity in their early life and communities. So you're very welcome, Neve, and um, we'll let you take it from here. Thank you. Thanks a million, Gloria. Um, it's very nice to be introduced by someone who I once sat in the room and was lectured by, Gloria. Thanks for that. Um, so, um, my, as Gloria said, my name is Neva Rourke. I am uh, one of the Inclusion Health Social Workers in St. James's Hospital. Um, so, my colleague and uh, my boss, uh, Professor Cleena Michalik, presented this morning. So, um, I'm really going to outline what the reality is um, of our Inclusion Health patients in the hospital um, when they're dealing with ill health and homelessness. Um, so just to kind of give a snapshot of who we deal with on the inclusion health team in um, St. James's Hospital. So our, our, our guys, we often call them, are 85% female, 85% male, um, with an average age of around 42. So quite a young population generally in comparison to the rest of the patients in the hospital. We, we deal with a huge proportion of people who have experienced care in their early lives. Um, a large population of the group we work with have also experienced imprisonment over the course of their lives. We have a higher than average percentage of Irish travellers in the cohort that we work with in comparison to the general population. Um, and we have a higher percentage of non-Irish nationals. So primarily in the inclusion health team at the moment, we focus solely on our homeless patients within the hospital to really advance their care needs within the hospital system through advocacy, but also to ensure that there's onward um, health care provided for them in the community. So in terms of what, the, what our cohort are dealing with in general, uh, in general sense, our, our homeless patients have earlier frailty than the general hospital population and the general population at large. And what I mean by frailty is, I mean how advanced their aging is in their bodies and they, that's shown through, often through, through their mobility. So there was a study done um, by a physiotherapist who worked with our team, um, which showed that 75% uh, of the homeless population surveyed could not traverse a simple flight of stairs. Um, and the average age in that population that was surveyed was around the 40 mark. So you're talking about really frail at a really young age, frailty that you wouldn't generally experience in the general hospital population or the general population at large for until at least the 70 to 80 mark. The, gen the people that we're dealing with generally uh, have a higher than average incidence of cognitive impairment. And that's up to and including those who are deemed to lack capacity to make their own decisions and might require to be, uh, to be held under the ward of, core, ward of core provisions in the courts. So those instances of cognitive impairment are sometimes known from an early age and sometimes are not known. But they're it, it often means for the person that they're unable to make long term decisions that would benefit their their lives. In a general sense, uh, we see a younger onset of multiple comorbidities. So what that means is 
of the disease of the disease profile of the, ho the hospital population in the inclusion health patients and homeless patients generally in the hospital we see people who have a number of ill health issues whether that be cardiac heart issues uh, pulmonary lung issues or kidney issues or infectious diseases in our cohort of homeless persons in inclusion health what we see is we see a lot of those instance, instances of ill health happening together at a much younger age. Um, and we also know, we also see that there's a, high, a higher instance of lengthy ICU admissions, so that's intensive care unit admissions. People that, uh, a lot of, uh, a larger proportion than, than the general hospital population of our group what might end up in the intensive care unit. If the guys end up in the intensive care unit, they often, end up there for longer periods of time than the general population. And in the background factors, and I suppose for me as a social worker, this is where, where, our, where my knowledge is really more, much more focused on. In a general sense, the people that we're working with in inclusion health, they've experienced much more adverse childhood experiences. So you're talking about neglect and abuse and experiences of separation and domestic abuse and um, imprisonment of a parent or mental health issues of a parent from a, from a young age. And in a general sense, there's been studies done in Cork um, through Sharon Lambert and uh, the Simon community in Cork, which showed that in a general sense, the homeless population generally might have seven or more adverse childhood experiences, whereas the, to have an impact on, on your health in the general population, people that have four or more adverse childhood experiences have a much greater impact on their health. So we're dealing really with people that have had huge amounts of impacts on their lives from a very early age. And there's also, in terms of um, adversity, I, like for me, you, there's no there's no way of separating the individual experience with the society with the community experience. So the, alongside having early childhood experience, early adverse childhood experiences, a huge amount of our, our um, population that we work with have also had adverse community experiences that are coming from the poorest, uh, the most low, the lowest socioeconomic backgrounds um, and the most deprived areas. Um, and I suppose for me, that's always really striking because for me, I come from one of those very low socioeconomic background areas, and I currently live in one of those uh, areas. So for me, it's always a case of there for the grace of God go, but I, because if, 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 if there were the differences between people who have adverse childhood experience and adverse community experiences, there's one or two different things could have made different impacts on people's lives. So alongside that early childhood trauma, there's also a huge amount of people in, in uh, the people we work with in inclusion health who have experienced lots of trauma. So not just the early adverse trauma, but the trauma since, their, since, the, since the start of their experience of homelessness or experiences of trauma that resulted in their homelessness. So for example, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, a couple of people in particular who have experienced uh, care experiences of care in their early childhood and would have had experiences of where that care broke care experience broke down and then resulted in homelessness those cumulative traumas have impacts on the body the body holds that and the outcomes in terms of people's health are much more challenged as a result so in terms of what they're dealing with on a very, very real day-to-day -day basis, a huge amount of people that we work with are uh, engaged in what's primarily rough sleep. Um, and for some, that's, that's a, that could be a choice because oftentimes people might feel safer to be by themselves away from a very often crowded or noisy or um, chaotic sometimes uh, emergency accommodation system. So the accommodation system is kind of broken down into private emergency accommodation, supported temporary accommodations, which are generally provided through the voluntary agencies, long term accommodations, which are generally provided through the voluntary agencies as well. And a, a, a proportion of uh, the lads that we work with would have tenancies through either House of Force or directly with the councils. 
people have experienced uh, experienced homelessness in the past. Um, so in terms of emergency accommodation, there's been 8,200 8, people in emergency accommodation in December 2020. And there has been particular, I know um, the guys from UCC might talk about the, the differences in terms of homelessness and COVID, but there has been measures put in place to protect the more, more vulnerable homeless population, given their uh, higher levels of ill health than the general population through shielding and isolation um, and isolation of, of COVID positive people in um, different accommodations. So I suppose to, to kind of outline the impact on people's health and well-being, it can be, um, I suppose for me, health, health is, a, is a very, very big and, and very broad way of looking at things. But in a general sense, I always look, look to the WHO and, and what they define as health as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So in terms of have that's, that, that's the kind of positive side of health. So, but in the, the homeless population um, and the guys that we, we work with in inclusion health, you're not just dealing with the absence of your, instead of looking at the absence of disease or infirmity, what you're actually seeing is the accumulation of multiple instances of disease, of infirmity, and of, at a very, very young age. So I kind of thought that it might be um, a little bit stark to look at a couple of uh, examples which are anonymized and with permission of the people that um, have, I've worked with. So I wanted to kind of talk you through um, an example of Connor is a 29 year old male and um, he would have had an experience uh, over a number of years of injecting drug use and um, had an undiagnosed cognitive impairment from childhood, a history of state care. He came to us in the hospital with an endocarditis and an endocarditis is a really, really life limiting um, and, uh, and can often uh, life end your life also. It's a disease, it's an infection of the heart. He had a lengthy admission, but while he was and had multiple admissions in and out of the hospital, and while he was coming in and out of the hospital, he was in shared accommodation. While he was also trying to engage in detoxification from his drug use, he was trying to affect change. He was trying to get more engaged with his family and with his um, children, particularly. And he was really, really struggling. The lengthy admission for him allowed him to have a period of stability um, to ensure that he could. To come off drugs as he as he wanted so he when he left the hospital he was drug free and started to engage in training and i suppose we did a huge amount of advocacy for him to be put into stable accommodation but he had been trying to become drug free for three years prior to that um but was in accommodations which were shared which were privately run which didn't have the supports that he required but when he went into into an area where he had much more support he really excelled and we're hoping that he might become a peer advocate for our programme in the near future. We've also, uh, a lady I wanted to highlight was a lady called Marion. Um, she's 26. She's someone that's from a very, uh, a very, I suppose, um, challenging background. She would have experienced a huge amount of neglect in, in her early years and has care experience and has her own children in care. And she has a disease called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is basically a, a difficulty of the lungs where she would be able to breathe out for, uh, without assistance through um, medications. Marion is a lady who has experienced a huge amount of trauma in her life and also would have been in coercive control relationships to the extent of a number of uh, community partners been really really concerned for her safety over a number of periods of time at the moment um marion is someone that i continue to worry about and she's at, still at the point of um having enough security in her life to be able to affect change at the moment she's in a, a, a an sta a support to temporary accommodation and trying to grapple with her drug use at present and i want to also to kind of highlight we uh, did well at I dealt with a gentleman uh, who's made it to six years of age, which is can be quite um, uh, it, it's not as common in the homeless population, given the age, early ages of death that I'll mention later. Um, he is a gentleman who also has COPD 
for the 20% lung function. And the reality of his world was that because he had a 20% lung function, he would require oxygen throughout the night to ensure that his breathing didn't dip below a level where he would, he would cease to be able to breathe fully at all. And he was provided over a period of years with pri private uh, emergency accommodations where he wouldn't have access to a plug to plug in his nebulizer machine and his oxygen um, to ensure that he was able to breathe, which resulted in him, chin in him choosing rough sleeping for lengthy periods of time, um, which in itself did not um, promote it, uh, good health for him. Um, there is a positive with, with Jackie because he is now currently accommodated um, in an over 55s accommodation and doing well, but it does not take away the fact that his lung function is still at 20% and he is unable to walk for more than 500 yards at a time. Two, mi two minutes. Uh... Thanks, Gloria. So just in terms of uh, outlining um, early preventable death, so the kind of the general stage, I think that the general outline is that um, the average age of death for men is around the 44 mark and for women is the 38 mark. When you compare that to the general population, it shows quite starkly the difference between um, the housed and the unhoused population. So just in terms of what could work, because I know that when Rory was setting up the program, it's it, read the conference is really around what would work for people in the future um, and what could work in terms of policy and provisions. What we've seen to work for, for some of the, work, the people that we work with is, uh, is the housing first system. At present, the housing first system doesn't appear on the ground to be as fully resourced as what the policy might lay out. Um, but what could work is that if there was provision of ample housing stock across the country, particularly um, in line with where people's um, social networks are, so that you could provide sufficient health and social care staff to allow the high enough input to link with people's needs. So what I mean by that really is to ensure that each health and social care staff would be able to visit people as often or as little as they need. And in reality, in, in a real term, what people require is security, a tenure, a tenure to engage with their health care needs that have been not been met over the previous years. Um, thanks a million for your attention and I'm interested in listening to everybody else. Uh, thank you very much, Neve. Uh, very interesting and important information. Um, the physical burdens of um, exclusion um, are not often talked about and the level of detail you've been able to provide with us is um, very important. So, so thank you Thanks, very Laura. much. Thanks. And uh, I'm sure that will generate a lot of uh, consideration and questions, etc. Uh, we'll move on now uh, uh, to our next speaker and a very warm welcome to Dr. Paula Mayock, Associate Professor in Trinity College Dublin. Uh, uh, so just as she's getting her slides ready, I'll um, introduce you uh, to Paula. Her research focuses primarily on the lives and experiences of marginalised youth, covering areas including homelessness, drug use and drug problems, sexuality, risk behaviour and mental health. She is the founder and uh, chairperson of the newly established Women's Homelessness in Europe Network, abbreviated to FWEN, W H E N, and she is the author of numerous articles, chapters, research reports, and and lots more in on these topics. So a very warm welcome, Paula, and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction, uh, Gloria, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted uh, to be here today speak about women's homelessness. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. There was a bit of a problem earlier with my sound on the test we did earlier, so I hope that everybody can hear me. <clears throat> uh, I want to thank Rory for inviting me as well here today. So I'm going to uh, talk about women's, uh, mainly their invisibility, and also I'm going to link very strongly in with women's service experiences. So I want to start by just commenting briefly on the extent of women's homelessness. So uh, what we have seen um, in countries throughout Europe is a, is a rapid feminization of homelessness. And this, of course, has preceded, long preceded the COVID-19 pandemic. So at the moment, approximately 35% 30, of our homeless population are women. 
and we're recording one of the highest proportions of women in our in the in, among homeless po populations throughout Europe. <clears throat> we also know, of course, that family uh, homelessness is uh, highly gendered, uh, primarily impacting low-income women who are mothers, and typically uh, these mothers are parenting alone. And in relation to single women, uh, we do need to recognise that, in fact, many of these uh, single women are mothers who are separated from their children, who therefore lose uh, their status as mothers and arguably have been very sidelined uh, and ignored over the years. So uh, turning to the whole uh, issue of gender and homelessness, well, homelessness research, of course, has long since been critiqued uh, for its gender neutral approach. And uh, over the years, uh, women's homelessness have only has only received quite sporadic uh, attention in the literature. Also, policy discourses throughout Europe, including in Ireland, largely ignore gender. So uh, uh, what we, you know, this situation is, is improving slightly, but progress is very slow. Also, uh, uh, we do know um, from research through in the European context that service responses lack gender sensitivity. In other words, um, you know, our homelessness responses are quite gender neutral and don't necessarily address the specific needs of women. And this is because, of course, uh, traditionally homeless service provision has been uh, traditionally oriented towards men. So women's homelessness has and continues to remain largely invisible within both academic and, dis and policy discourses on homelessness. And it's useful to look back, and uh, Kleena mentioned uh, this earlier, that it, it can be, um, that it's interesting and important to look back historically. Um, when we want to understand a, a particular situation, whether it's related to health or well-being, or whether it's related to women specifically. And we do know, of course, that historically, dominant uh, constructions have depicted homeless women, uh, and this is, it would be in the literature and in, in the media, as deviant, transgressive, and by implication, as largely unworthy. In the literature, we see terms like eccentric, bag lady, etc. And frequently, there is an underlying assumption here of sexual deviancy. Um, today, of course, the language used is far different, it's far more nuanced, but there are arguably, um, uh, uh, there is arguably evidence of continuity in how women are viewed and their situations understood. For example, prevailing ideas about women and family and the home really uh, draw our attention to this. And we also have these categories. We tend to categorize women, singles, lone parent, families, and so on. And these constructions are visible in the manner in which women who experience homelessness then are dealt with um, by uh, service uh, responses and policy. And uh, this is visible, for example, in the bureaucratic and organizational structures governing service delivery in many countries. Now, there are other um, intersecting factors that account for women's invisibility, and these include, but are not limited to, the issue of measurement and the fact that enumeration techniques very often serve to obscure the, the extent of women's homelessness. There was discussion earlier about hidden homelessness, and we do know that women are particularly likely to remain hidden, especially at the early stages of their homelessness. More generally, there's an undercounting of women's homelessness. For example, women who access domestic violence services are not counted as homeless in many European countries, including Ireland. And finally, uh, beginning to emerge uh, from the literature is evidence that women's uh, responses to homelessness uh, can serve to conceal their situations. And I will be returning uh, to that point in a little while. So in terms of gendered homelessness, um, well, a growing body of research is contributing uh, to a gendered understanding of homelessness. So what do we know? Well, we do know that experiences such as childhood sexual abuse and intimate partner violence and also maternal trauma 
can push women along a trajectory of housing instability and homelessness. Now, of course, these experiences are not limited to, to women, but they are gendered. And the role of domestic violence and other forms of gender-based violence in women becoming homeless is probably one of the strongest indicators that gender matters. There is widespread recognition that the COVID-19 pandemic has led to rising numbers of girls and women experiencing homelessness and that lockdown measures ha have led to a, 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 a very strong increase in demand for already limited resources and services, placing a huge strain on both domestic violence and homelessness services. And in fact, domestic violence has been described as a shadow uh, pandemic. And importantly, uh, I suppose to mention as well, that quarantine and lockdown measures um, imposed necessarily, obviously, by governments to curb the spread of COVID-19 have arguably um, deepened and certainly exposed already entrenched uh, gender inequalities. Now, beyond research evidence pointing to the importance of gender and understanding the drivers of homelessness, there is considerable evidence now that women's experiences and responses to homelessness have distinguishing features. So in a recent uh, uh, evidence review uh, that uh, I worked on with Joanne Bretherton from the University of York, we looked um, in detail at, at women's service experiences and three major themes emerged from this literature. The first relates to service uh, avoidance among women, the second to their diminished autonomy, and finally, the theme of women seeking solutions independently. So I'll just say a few things about each of these in turn. Firstly, in relation to service um, avoidance, uh, well, we know that women avoid services and that they frequently occupy spaces of hidden homelessness. Explanations for service avoidance tend to focus on uh, and draw attention to women's awareness of male dominated spaces and their fear of victimization. But there are other more complex reasons and these relate strongly to stigma. And the fact that women very frequently express ambivalence about the term homeless and that they prefer to occupy spaces where they are not uh, labeled as homeless. In terms then of diminished uh, autonomy, well, very strongly here, of course, we know that uh, both men and women experience diminished autonomy due to lack of privacy, strict rules and so on that govern um, the everyday life within uh, homelessness services. But there are particular um, uh, losses that accompany shelter life for women. And um, these relate strongly to feelings of objectification and this sense of powerlessness is also closely associated with experiences of infantilization. For example, women routinely report being treated like children by shelter staff and assumed to be incapable. And many struggle with the rules that negatively impact, of course, their, their interactions with their children, leading to them feeling subservient. And mothers, on the other hand, who are accessing homelessness services alone without their children, as I said earlier, uh, are lose their status as mothers and are constantly dealing with the stigma of lost motherhood. And the final theme then of women seeking solutions, um, and this relates very strongly to women's own uh, responses and actions and their reluctance to remain within homelessness services. So that what we have is evidence of women effectively uh, disappearing from the grid of invisibility and excluding themselves from services. And this is in their effort to seek um, solutions independently without support. Um, very often they'll exit to poor quality private rental accommodation, but inevitably they return. And what we're seeing, what we've seen here and what my own work with uh, Sarah Sheridan has revealed is that these women embark on this institutional uh, circuit as they seek ontolo ontological security. So that very importantly, homelessness services do not, uh, their access to homelessness services does not mean that they progress along a trajectory 
out of homelessness, but that they may instead embark on this constant cycle, um, leading them in and out of homelessness um, for very long periods. So looking then to service responses, well, we do know that historically so-called fallen um, women were managed in the main uh, by institutions. And these institutions were often religious or evangelical in orientation. And what was happening here basically was that women were being classified as something other than homeless, rendered invisible and simultaneously or othered. Now, of course, today, service provision for women um, who experience homelessness is different, is clearly different, but we do see this enduring reliance on emergency shelters, and this does uh, represent a significant point of continuity. A recent analysis uh, at a European level of national strategic approaches, approaches to homelessness has found that the staircase model of service provision prevails in a majority of countries. Now, this research didn't specifically analyze a service provision according to gender, but we can assume that the staircase uh, uh, model dominates for both men and women. And it can also be reasonably assumed that uh, homelessness services remain focused on responding to the most urgent needs of women. Now, we also know that um, women's access to homelessness services can be limited. We don't have systematic information on this. There are women-only services in a number of services, in a number of countries, um, including Ireland, but these tend to be far fewer in number than mixed gender services. And very importantly, uh, a recent FIANSA um, a guide, a set of guidelines uh, on developing effective gender um, supports for women has emphasized that women only services are run by female staff for women and they are crucial for women on both an emotional and physical level. So this report drawing very strong attention to the need for homelessness or the need for homelessness services that include a women only services. I should mention that COVID-19 service responses, um, as we know, a whole range of mitigating strategies were put in place early during the pandemic. Um, but importantly, um, within these analysis to date, um, gender or the impact on, of um, COVID-19 on women experiencing homelessness specifically uh, has tended not to be the focus of dedicated uh, research attention. Also in terms of service responses, and of course, um, I mentioned earlier the strong connection between uh, domestic violence and homelessness, but um, homelessness and domestic violence services are, um, are tend to, to operate very separately. They're classified as discrete uh, problems and processes and responded to by separate systems, despite the fact that both of these issues and challenges are intertwined and overlapping. And uh, I suppose complex social issues such as homelessness and domestic violence, they are cross-cutting. We have had considerable investment in efforts to address both, but there is a lack of integration among stakeholders, policies, government, community members, and so on. And uh, particularly in recent years, in the last couple of years, the, the need for better coordination between these two service sectors has been heavily emphasized. For example, here, Nicholas Police and colleagues highlight you know, that there should be further cooperation and exchange between homelessness and domestic violence services. And uh, I should mention maybe that uh, a colleague of mine, um, Fiona Neary, uh, uh, are looking at this issue specifically in relation to uh, in relation to family home, the intersection of family homelessness and domestic violence, that research is uh, funded by Focus Ireland and the Housing Agency and hope, we hope to release it uh, in the next six months or so. Two minutes, Paula. Okay, thanks, Gloria. Um, just finally, uh, in relation to service responses, uh, 
it is important to flag issues around homeless family hubs that were basically a reconfiguration or renaming of what is an essentially an institutionalizing and institutional response to women's homelessness. And uh, these uh, facilities do arguably represent a continuation of uh, what I referred to earlier in relation to these historical constructions and responses to women's homelessness. Also, Housing First for Women is, uh, uh, is very underdeveloped and Housing First discourses tend to largely ignore gender. Uh, important to mention, however, that a recent evaluation of a Housing First for Women project in the UK uh, has heavily emphasised the need for trauma-informed approaches to service de delivery and also service responses that recognise that many women who are mothers um, are coming to terms with the loss of their, of their children, the, the absence of their children, and that we need more work that aims specifically uh, to reconnect uh, women with their children. So to draw uh, just a few uh, broad conclusions. Well, uh, uh, discourses are gradually shifting and the debate is gradually changing, but progress is, um, uh, in my view, frustratingly slow here. A gender perspective on homelessness is urgently needed. We have a as I said earlier, we have a, a, a basic lack of, of data and undercounting of women's homelessness. Analyses of the impact of COVID-19 have tended not to explicitly address uh, gender. Uh, of course, uh, we are all aware of, uh, of um, uh, the public discussion and, and uh, on the issue of domestic violence and how that has related to COVID-19. Uh, homelessness policy in Ireland and elsewhere has largely ignored gender. And finally, um, there is a clear need um, for gender uh, respond, gendered responses to service responses that acknowledge uh, the situations and experiences of women and the fact that many will have experienced domestic and other forms of gender-based violence. So I'll leave it there. Thank you for listening and I'm very happy to take questions or comments later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. That was a very detailed and a, a exquisitely presented um, uh, overview of the way in which women are invisible but in plain sight um, in the whole area of homelessness. Um, I'd like to remind people that there is a Q&A um, chat box in which you can put questions as we go along and also that this session is being recorded and will be available on the Reboot Republic um, uh, site uh, if people want to listen again to um, all of this kind of rich detail from our presenters today. So thank you very much, Paula. And again, I'm sure this is going to really heighten awareness and bring out a lot of questions and thoughts for people attending the session today. Uh, I'm going to welcome our third speaker, who's Margaret Buckley. And as Margaret is uh, getting ready to put up her slides, I'll um, introduce Margaret. Um, Margaret is the author of uh, Systems Accelerant, the responses of Simon communities to first wave COVID-19. Uh, she is a lecturer in University College Cork. You're very welcome, Margaret. Uh, Margaret is, is joined today by her co-author of the report, which came out in January this year, Joe Finnerty. But Margaret is going to give us um, the, the main presentation and uh, uh, I'll hand over to you. So, Margaret, thank you. Thanks very much, Gloria. Uh, yeah, un unfortunately, with online presenting, it makes doing a, a two-person presentation quite difficult. But thanks very much for having us. It's great to be able to outline some of the main findings from our recent research. Uh, so our research is called Systems Accelerant, and really what we were looking at was the responses of Simon communities uh, to the first wave of COVID-19, and that is all of the Simon communities in the country. So just to give you an idea um, of this, uh, just, just to give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about today. So I'll just set the context and very, very briefly look at the Simon communities, what we actually set out to do in the research, how we went about it, what we found, a little bit about explaining the findings and where we're going from here. So to set the context first, 
Uh, there are eight different Simon communities which cover all of the counties in Ireland, all 26 counties. Um, originally, Simon was founded in Dublin in uh, 1969 and has since expanded to become one of the leading homeless NGOs in Ireland. So I'm sure everybody here is aware. So uh, the principal focus really for Simon is on the single homeless person, uh, many of which, many of whom have complex needs. And as such, Simon provides a range of different services. Now, this is probably a little bit too small uh, for everybody to read, but it just gives you an idea of the type of services available. So you have housing supports, rough sleeper outreach, the advice clinics, long-term supported housing, tenancy sustainment, Family Hub, um, house, Housing First, Health Clinic and Referrals, Food Banks and or Super Runs, Personal Development and Activities and Regional Support Services. And again, as you can probably see from the little bubbles, <clears throat> while not all of the Simons will be able to offer the, all of the services, they all are offered somewhere. So what the purpose of the research was in the first place was we wanted to evaluate the responses of the eight Simon communities to the challenges posed by the first wave of COVID-19 during March to August uh, last year. And really what we were looking at was um, the Simon community's perspective, but also of the key statutory respondents. So that was a number of different local authorities and uh, people from different branches of the HSE as well. Um, so just how we did it, we did online, qualitative interviews with managers from the eight Simons, the corresponding HSE and local authority personnel. And for the larger Simons, interviews were conducted with a number of different Simon and statutory informants across different roles. So we had emergency, we had housing support, street outreach, we were looking at, say, addiction and counselling services as well. In total, we interviewed 19 people. So we got quite a nice broad overview of everything that was happening. Uh, from a couple of different perspectives, which is great. So I'm just going to run through uh, the selected research findings. This is going to be a little bit of a whistle stop tour, I'm afraid. Um, but if anyone's interested, the report is freely available online, uh, which goes into a lot more depth. Um, so first of all, there were several challenges, as you can imagine, facing those same communities that provide emergency accommodation. Um, in terms of decreasing the density and the number of people in shelters. So as a result of high numbers of people in emergency services, space was a real, real issue in attempting to keep service users and staff safe. Um, that then involved decanting, as it's called, um, existing residents into other services or facilities, which required, as you can imagine, very substantial organization and planning work. So just to give you some examples of, we have quotations throughout just as illustrations of the findings. So um, the immediate thing was how you create distance and services that are oversubscribed. The shelter is always over capacity and the normal practice would have been to try and bring as many people in as possible. Um, and again, there was a very big piece of work between ourselves and the city council. And I think there is a link here between um, what happened with Simon and what Paula mentioned a few minutes ago about interagency cooperation, and that's going to come out a little bit more as we go on. So yeah, big piece of work between ourselves and the city councillor and identifying people within the shelter who could move to other options, which was great. So I'm not going to read through all of the, uh, the quotes. But one of the, the big issues, you know, was that people were trying so hard to battle against kind of bureaucracy and the red tape to help people into their safe and secure accommodation while they could, so um, on the left there, we have one quote from uh, the local authority in that they had a battle on their hands. And on the other side, you had a lot of the people didn't want to go because there was no support. You know, the support wasn't there on site. The way it was an STA, um, support temporary accommodation. They were, you know, afraid to go, afraid of being lonely, afraid of being locked in somewhere where there was nobody else there. And that is completely understandable. But in spite of all of those difficulties, there was a very important lesson learned by all of the agencies. So one of the big learnings for us, um, there were supported by the HSE and the council was that congregate settings are not ideal. Um, if a good thing has come out of it, it has given the HSE and the council more focus. We need to move away from congregate settings like big shelters. 
where people are sleeping next to each other. So we're working on something with the council to solve that. Great. Um, in terms of food banks and soup runs then, again, as you can imagine, it was impossible to continue on with soup runs in most of the regions due to the inability to ensure that everyone was safe. But the outreach teams um, were continuing to distribute the food and water. So unfortunately, the soup runs had to be called off very early, but um, the outreach team very much stepped in here and giving out sandwiches, water and chocolate. Um, unfortunately, then, as far as rough sleepers and drop-in services were concerned, they had to be curtailed, um, again, just down to the whole nature of the pandemic. But in some areas, restricted drop-in facilities by appointment continued on to allow people, you know, showers, washing facilities, if they needed, you know, cooking facilities or even just to get food. But then it was on appointment basis so that social distancing could be maintained. Um, then, of course, we have uh, during the peak of the crisis, the number of rough sleepers decreased principally as a result of their accepting accommodation and the changing nature of the accommodation offer then was pivotal in that regard. So nobody who comes into self-isolation from, from rough sleeping is going to be exiting. It should be too rough sleeping. Um, we worked very, very closely with the local authority around exit planning. So exiting people into more stable accommodation. Some exited into B&Bs, others into shelters, others to housing first, which didn't. There, one of the regions has a family hub, um, which meant, and actually in that particular region, it meant that a lot of the families were fast-tracked into social housing, which again was great. So um, as you can see from the quote there, so about two weeks, we moved 10 families out, some went to local authority housing, some went to other AHB housing, and some went back to the hotel or B&B accommodation. That was only for two families, um, and it was only while they were waiting for their accommodation to become available that that happened, which, again, is fantastic. Um, in terms of tenancy sustainment, much of the work in tenancy sustainment had, had to be moved to telephone support, but some of the work continued in, in person. Um, moving to telephone support is difficult for both staff and clients because both are used to, of course, face-to-face -face meetings, um, but they did actually manage it in some way. Um, and as you can see there as well, I think it was a challenge from the services perspective in the sense of they just wanted people. So why are you going again? Sure, you're just in the door. Would you not bring me such a place? Would you not do whatever? It's that kind of frustration. And again, that's completely understandable. In terms of housing support and housing first, uh, much of the housing support again had to be moved to telephone support only. So there wasn't any face-to-face -face meetings. Um, some of the people were okay with that. Some of them couldn't manage it as well as, again, as you can see from the quote there, some of them wouldn't have great life skills such as cooking and will always use the drop-in centers. And of course they were closed. So they soon actually became very, very isolated um, and they had very limited wraparound supports because, again, of the regulations. <clears throat> but despite all of those different difficulties, Housing First services were expanded in some instances. So intensive support was maintained throughout and not just maintained, but the service actually developed in that more and more tenancies were filled as they came along. Um, throughout the pandemic, the service managed to support the people involved and didn't press pause on more people coming into the service, which is a fantastic step forward. In terms of long-term support housing then, so we had challenges of containment and mitigation, uh, likewise confronted other congregate settings. So in terms of encouraging residents to comply with distancing and hygiene guidelines. So it's very hard to social distance when you live in a congregate setting as you can imagine, um, and where your meals are catered for. So the service has to go through a very rapid change of how we're going to facilitate keeping people safe, keeping their team safe, and safe and being able to provide the care necessary. Two minutes, Margaret. Okay, I'm going to skip forward. I'm sorry, uh, going very quickly here. So there were some practical difficulties in relation to social distancing. Okay, I'm going to stop with the quotes now. I'm going to assume everyone can read them themselves. Um, in terms of addiction and counselling, again, all of that moved to either online or to video platforms. Um, some clients were actually okay with that and some of them actually preferred it. 
Others then not so much, again, so used to the face-to-face -face, uh, situation. Um, and in terms of methadone services, it was actually expedited in some areas, which meant that people with addiction um, did not have to wait for long periods of time to be included. So methadone being made more widely available, coupled with people being accommodated in suitable accommodation did actually result um, in some of people's addictions becoming more manageable, which is great. Unfortunately, though, there were a number of overdoses as a result of people not having access to their drug of choice, so therefore they went to a different type of substance, um, which is awful. Um, staffing, <laughs> uh, essentially, there we could, Simon couldn't have any volunteers, so a lot of full-time and part-time staff had to step into the roles, which meant that a lot of people were double-jobbing. Um, but they did a fantastic job in keeping everything moving and a wonderful job in uh, organizing everything. This has uh, managed to adapt. The interagency cooperation and again, renewed client focus. This was uh, one of the big findings that came out of the research that because it was a health led response, um, there was they were able to cut through a lot of bureaucracy and red tape and actually get to what mattered, which was the service users and the clients, and actually trying to help them out of homelessness. The findings, so we had the, the decrease in the number of people in emergency accommodation, the number of existing rough sleepers decreased a lot, which was great, and that was as a result of increased offers of accommodation, a lot of innovations around methadone treatment, and thankfully, very low levels of infection amongst a uh, homeless population, which is wonderful. And uh, the term systems accelerant is actually taken from Sealy 2020, and it's basically the idea of the strengthened implementation of principles already espoused at policy level. So the elimination of involuntary rough sleeping and long-term use of emergency accommodation and provision of independent accommodation with appropriate supports. Okay, and that's okay, and then just, I think this particular quote is very important. So I do think it's down to key individuals and key people driving that kind of culture forward. There's a culture of practice. The stuff we did here, I'm just very proud of it from a humanitarian perspective. Um, and the future research, this is actually a one piece of research that forms a part of a whole a larger study. So um, our next phase is to actually interview the service users themselves. And we're just starting on that at the moment. And over the summer for phase three, we'll be doing follow up interviews with the Simon communities and the local authority and HSE respondents from the last time, just to see if the systems accelerant has been sustained over the last year or so. And thank you to everyone throughout. So to Simon communities um, research advisory group, the interviewees from the HSE local authority, Simon, and of course, everybody who is living and working um, in the unsettling times and homeless sites. So thank you very much. And I'm sorry if I went over time. No, not at all, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting research and really a study in what can be possible when people do work together and when there is, you know, um, enough motivation for, for change and uh, to, you know, uh, COVID unfortunately seems to have been the impetus behind a lot of those changes, but what maybe was deemed impossible suddenly became possible. So this is a study of the possible really, and and many um, changes that you're documenting, so important to document how those changes happened and the impact of those changes. So really very interesting um, information there. And I'm sure again, people listening, uh, today and to the the will be on the reboot uh, republic podcast that you know they will want to go and read more detail in in your report and um uh and thank you for that very very interesting uh, we have come to the end of our hour and i know we're going to be cut off very quickly so i i do need to thank all our speakers today nevo rock paula mayock Margaret Buckley with Joe Finnerty in attendance um, and to thank you so much for such a rich session. I wish we had more time, but we, we do have to go now and uh, many more sessions uh, today and tomorrow. Um, so thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>
Yep, you're good to go, Tanya. You're on mute, though. Tanya, you're on mute. Can you hear us? The very bottom of your screen, you'll see the little microphone. All right. <laughs> That's fine. Great, we can hear you now. Yeah, hi. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, great. You're on and now live. If you'd like to, uh... oh, are we live? <laughs> oh, Thank you. I wanted to ask. I wanted to be sure that I pronounce names well, so I thought I thought I'll do that before we go live. <laughs> it's Sorry. fine. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to um, introduce Mike Allen and Saija Turinen. Um, Mike Allen is a director of advocacy, communication and research at Focus Island. He has held the position of president of the European Federation of National Organizations working with uh, homelessness, uh, FINSA, and is a former member of the National Economic and Social Council, NESC. Um, and Seiya Turinen is a research manager with the Y Foundation Finland. Um, the foundation, the Y Foundation is one of the key national developers of the housing first principle in Finland. The Y Foundation offers affordable rental housing and are a leader in the eradication of homelessness. Prior to working with um, the Y Foundation, uh, Seja was a senior researcher with the Center for Excellence on Social Welfare in Helsinki. So it is my pleasure to welcome both of you. We look forward to an informative and insightful hour and um, to benefiting from uh, your vast insights and expertise in the area of housing and homelessness, especially in Ireland and Finland. Uh, I also want to uh, welcome all attendees to this session of the conference and to encourage all um, to please share this event by tweeting and posting uh, using the hashtag home a human right. I also want to mention that this session is being recorded and the recording can be accessed uh, on Rory's um, platform on his uh, podcast, Reboot Republic. I believe it's also, uh, it's, this will also be posted on Musi website. So um, it's just an hour, so I wouldn't take much more time um, so that we, you know, hopefully we'll be able to have time to take a few questions. And um, so I, 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 if I, if you, uh, if I can start um, uh, with you, Mike, um, I, I'll open the floor for you to, to start. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much. Well, I um, put this uh, slide, I don't know. Can you see the, the slide? Yes, it's just not in presentation mode yet. Okay. Is that okay? Perfect, thank you. Great, I was uh, enjoying the uh, subtitles there. I, I, I thought um, SIA's organization, which is one of the leading organizations in homelessness in Europe, appearing first of all as the Why Foundation as opposed to the Why Foundation was good until that was followed up by the Wife Foundation, which I think is even better. And then that was just as I thought that it couldn't get any better. Rory Ahern turned into Aurora. Uh, so it's great fun. Uh, so if you don't if you don't enjoy my presentation, I hope there are at least some interesting things on the subtitles which will keep you amused. Um, what I've been asked to uh, to talk about is, is ending homelessness. I think the, the conference uh, today and tomorrow is uh, exploring a whole wide range of uh, issues to do with housing and to do with homelessness itself. I mean, from the point of view of, of uh, organization, one of the largest housing and homeless organizations in Ireland, um, the pri our primary interest in homelessness is in ending it. 
but clearly we have a huge interest in understanding it and, and, and working with it. But this notion that the, the, the primary engagement with it should be um, to be to end homelessness is extremely important. So I really thank you for uh, allowing me to, to, to speak on, on, on that today. Um, when we talk about ending homelessness, there are essentially two types of negative reactions which emerge immediately. And, and the first of those is that it's naive or that it's utopian or that, well, you're very foolish because there's always going to be somebody who's in crisis or it's just impractical or the particularly cynical one is that you don't really mean it because homeless organizations don't want to end homelessness because we're more interested in our own, own survival. That's very, those are very, very strong. Uh, responses when you when, when you talk uh, 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 about this idea. So I think in response to that, I think you have to be very clear about what we mean by ending homelessness. It would be naive to say that you could arrive at a situation where at all times, everywhere, somebody had a safe and secure place to be. There are crises that happen in people's lives. There are um, uh, natural disasters. There are a whole range of reasons why for uh, for a period of time, somebody uh, late in the evening might find that they could no longer stay where they expected to that night. But that doesn't mean you can't end homelessness as we understand it. Our idea of ending homelessness is if, if you were in a situation where the experience of homelessness was rare and short or rare and brief, or where few people became homeless and no one will, remained homeless for long, we would be happy to say that we've uh, ended homelessness. In some senses, it's comparable to the idea of full employment being the end to, to, to unemployment. Everybody knows that in a situation of full employment, not everybody at that moment has a job. But in a real situation of full employment, there should be nobody who's out of a job for a long period of time. Some people have used this uh, phrase functional zero for homelessness, which I think can be useful, which essentially means that you've reached this point where, where homelessness is, uh, is brief um, and rare. I think there are some warnings you'd need to use in terms of adopting that in that some of the American organizations using it simply use it to, to mean a situation in which the same number of people enter homelessness as leave it, um, which if there are a large number of people uh, homeless at the time you start that process, could mean that you would have a very significant number of people homeless for a long time and still be claiming to have reached zero. So uh, like many terms we tried to use to describe um, social progress, it has been captured by some organizations to, 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 to find something very different. There's still a very interesting idea that, that functional zero uh, homelessness. Um, would there be any need for homeless services at all in such a situation? Well, there would be a lot of need for strong prevention services, tenancy sustainment, a whole range of other services supporting vulnerable people. People who at the moment experience homelessness, but would still need uh, supports uh, in their lives and various forms of social social supports to uh, even in a situation where you ended homelessness. And you need a, a small number of shelter beds and, and Sia's talking after me and, and uh, the achievements there in terms of what they've done in, in Helsinki are a good example. They don't claim yet to have ended homelessness in, 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 in Finland, but they, the number of shelter beds they have, which appears to be sufficient for their needs, is, is, is tiny compared to what we have. The second response you get when you, you say you want to end homelessness is, is probably more insidious. It's, a, well, of course, um, isn't that common sense? So we're already doing that, um, so we don't need to change. And it's just an add-on piece of rhetoric that, that organizations can add to, to their existing set of services. Um, so I think it's very useful to, to look at what we mean and what the sort of beliefs we might have about, uh, about homelessness if we were doing either of the two things. So what I want to do is to compare the goal of ending homelessness with the objective of managing homelessness um, and, and, and explain a little bit how they different ways of, of, of thinking about homelessness, and then think, talk a little bit about, uh, about what difference it makes, depending on which of your objectives that you have. So that screen there um, tries to divide some framework in which, on the left-hand side, the sorts of things that you talk about and think about or understand to be homelessness, if you're managing homelessness. And on the right-hand side, um, what you might be thinking about if your objective is to end homelessness. So in the managing homeless framework, we tend to concentrate enormously on rough sleeping. Uh, we say, and you, the, the, the sense that rough sleeping is real homelessness, and that's where we need to put, put, put our energies. 
the ending homelessness framework, we have a much wider definition of what it means to be homeless or to be living in precarious housing and, and, and hidden homelessness and all the rest of it. And a recognition that while rough sleeping is appalling, um, only about 2% of, of, of people in homeless, of people who are even um, officially homeless in Ireland ever rough sleep on any given night, it rarely is more than 1%. 1%. Similarly, um, if you're looking at a managing homeless framework, you tend to get language like some form of homelessness is inevitable, while the ending homelessness framework sees that homelessness is actually caused by public policies and that those policies themselves are capable of being changed. The managing homelessness framework seems to tends to see homelessness as caused by addiction and mental health issues, that the best response from homeless organizations are soup, sleeping bags, hot meals, and so on, and those make a big difference. And it tends to see homelessness as a social problem. While in the ending homelessness framework, the, there's a recognition that homelessness is caused by housing systems. And yes, it does fall most heavily on those with addictions and mental health issues, but the, they aren't the cause of the homelessness. It's the housing problems that are. And the, while humanitarian aid is essential, um, the only really meaningful or transformative response involves providing a home and support to live in that home if that's re required. And that homelessness is, of course, a social problem, but it is primarily a housing problem. And from a point of view of managing homelessness, there's, this, there's a very strong emphasis on a need for compassion around homelessness. You hear a lot of discourse around, um, we're all, you know, compassion uh, doesn't just, one group doesn't just have, have compassion. Leo Varadka was very frequently, his interventions on homelessness are, are claims that compassion is something that he feels about homelessness and other people, people do. Very often that sort of language belongs to the managing homelessness framework. People who are ending homeless, of course they have compassion for people who are homeless, but they primarily see people who are homeless as rights holders, people with uh, uh, dignity, people with human rights, people whose situation must be transformed rather than that we just feel compassion or indeed pity for them. So those are, I think that begins to see if we, we talk then about uh, ending homelessness, not just as a piece of rhetoric that we can add on to our press releases, but as something which is quite distinct from the frame of mind which would leap, which uh, which you would have if you were just trying to manage uh, manage homeless. I want to say as well that it's really important to say that I'm not saying that everybody who wants to manage homelessness is bad and people who want to end homelessness is, is good. Um, it isn't like that. Um, many of the people and organizations who work uh, with the concept of managing homelessness, care deeply about people who are homeless. I mean, many of the religious organizations, which do much, so much work around the world, see homelessness as an inevitable part of, of, of human nature and their role is helping homeless people. And they do an enormous amount of good. So I'm not, I'm not dividing it into good and bad. There are those amongst the managing homelessness side who, um, well, you might use the word bad. Um, I'll come back to some of the sort of, if you like, um, policing forms of managing homelessness and mention them uh, along the way. Um, but I do believe that a deep understanding of the nature of homelessness, how it comes about, and the capacities and potential of our society will bring you to the situation of believing that ending homelessness is actually um, the, um, it is the objective that you, you need to, to, to set. So if I talk to briefly about what that would mean at a high level, it's useful to look in, at a specific in, instance where having a ending homelessness um, uh, framework and, and objective might lead you to behave differently than we, we currently do within our managing homelessness framework. And an example I want to use is one that's been very controversial over the last number of months and over the winter, which is the use of local connection rule in terms of, of access to homeless services. And this is a rule which is applied uh, by local authorities which when a person presents to homeless services and it looks for emergency accommodation they're asked whether they have a local connection a connection with the local authority area where they're looking for the emergency accommodation and failure to satisfy this uh, criteria can lead to a person being turned down for emergency accommodation essentially being forced to to, to sleep rough um, this is a very complex area and those of you who are familiar with it will probably be pleased to know I'm not going to go into all those complexities. It is important to say though that that most people including Focus Ireland believe that local authorities are misapplying the rule and 
the way that they apply it is in itself wrong. But I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to go into the way it's actually operated. Local connection has a very, very long history. Um, it goes back at least to the poor laws, and it goes back to the, the, the history in which people who are living in poverty and who are in, in, um, in need were helped by their local parish. And local parishes perhaps reasonably said, we're going to look after people from our par parish, but we're not, if we do that well, people from other parishes will come here and then we'll end up having to look after everybody's poor. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a uh, we'll end up um, being treated as fools because we'll have to, to um, we'll have to support everybody. So we're only going to support people who need our help from our area. And that notion of looking after your own has followed through in legislation, not just in Ireland, but right across Europe. And there's a very interesting European Observatory study on this showing its connection in every European country. And it's followed through into Irish practice in terms of local authorities seeing themselves only ever requirement to provide emergency accommodation for people who have a local connection with their area. So this is quintessentially a managing homelessness approach because it means that a person who is destitute has nowhere to sleep that night their first engagement with a public service, which is meant to support them, are, sir, um, circles around the question, which is essentially about who's going to pay for this? Whose responsibility is this? Is it mine? If it's not, where can I send them? That is a question about how we manage uh, homelessness. And it is never a question uh, about what the actual person needs and what's in their best interests. I would argue that a, a, a national objective of ending homelessness would turn that on, the, on, it, on its head. That such a first engagement to the, the person from Carlo or Sligo who is in Dublin, or the person from Dublin who is in, 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 in Sligo, instead of saying, where do you belong and who is responsible for paying for your emergency accommodation? It would be about what is in your best interest? What do you need? And how can the intervention which starts today contribute to ending your homelessness and indeed homelessness in, in general. And sometimes that might mean that the best route for the, such a person is to go back to the place where they have family connections and friendships and, and other social connections. In other occasions, that might be the very last thing they could do because they may be homeless because of debts and they may actually be in fear of their life going back to, 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 to where they are. Or they may simply be ashamed of what has happened to them and they're better able to deal with their homelessness if they're in a neutral place where, where, where nobody actually knows them. But those decisions will be made on the needs and the perceptions of the person as to what's best for them rather than a management question about who's going to pay for the roof over your head. And I think people recognise in that a fundamental difference in the way that our services, our public services and home, uh, from local authorities engage with people from the very moment that they um, turn up at the door or, or are on the, uh, as of today, uh, are, are on the phone. Um, so that one example where, where um, you can see that this uh, uh, di is fundamentally different in the way that we would approach the issue. But there are a number of other ones which I just want to briefly mention. For instance, um, the one managing homelessness, and this is the pernicious managing homelessness measure, is the use by shops and other, uh, uh, and other architects and other designers of, of, of our street environment to use a hostile environment to prevent people from rough sleeping. That is a way of negatively managing homelessness. So we're not going to deal with the issue. We're going to make sure that the that that, 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 that rough sleepers and people who are homeless aren't, aren't visible. Um, begging restrictions and, and other sort of street, uh, uh, um, uh, design, street policing measures are exactly the same. But what would, how would we approach an issue like hygiene facilities, like showers and toilets for people who are street homeless? Should we see those, and I would tend to see those primarily as providing facilities to allow homelessness to continue rather than a, a taking an approach that you wanted to, uh, to end homelessness. So if somebody is sleeping in a tent and needs a shower, wouldn't it be better to respond to that by providing them with them a home rather than providing them with some sort of mobile shower? But that is a question which I think is, is, is open to, to, to discussion and it clearly depends on how quickly you're going to provide them with the home. Somebody housing first, in one way of looking at it as a philosophy, is essentially an ending homelessness sort of philosophy. But in the Irish context, exists in a situation where there is no national objective to end homelessness. So it exists as a 
program to help a certain group of home of people who are homeless out of homeless and it has targets to do so but nowhere in our current strategy does it indicate what overall impact that would have on the total number of people who are homeless or that it is part of an overall strategy with a number of different elements which is designed to end homelessness and i believe that housing first would look very different as a program in the context of ending homelessness that, than it does now similarly provision of shelter accommodation of course somebody who has no shelter for the night needs roof over their head but we have built more we have commissioned more shelter accommodation in the last four years than we have built social housing. And there's something very profoundly wrong with that and something uh, indicating, again, what are our objectives in this. And here's a really challenging one. If we are wanting to end homelessness and all our energy goes into ending it, what about the sort of therapeutic interventions for children in homeless families, which we've talked about earlier in this conference? Are we not, is the sort of work that Focus Ireland and other, uh, uh, and other organizations does in trying to support those families in managing homelessness um, question? And I think the answer to that is, it is yes. And it, so it's a slightly different way of looking at the dichotomy I said uh, before. While we are trying to end homelessness, we also need to manage it because as we've heard earlier in the conference, homelessness is damaging to people. So you, if you cannot provide a home immediately, and that's where we are going to be for a, a number of years, you have to make sure that the while people are homeless, it does as little damage to them as possible. So having set it up as a, a, a choice, either or an or, you have to recognize that some humanitarian and managing work needs to go in along with your ending homelessness. But that is an open and public debate that, that we need to, to enter into to understand how far we need to go in, in, in that before we end up going down a route, a route of making home, homeless a normal thing and putting around expensive and, and very long living systems to manage it, which is what we've done for the last number of years. It's important to we've tried homelessness before. There were a series of strategies in the noughties, which culminated in a, a way home, which had the target of ending long-term homelessness and, an, and a need to sleep rough by 2010. That strategy was driven by homeless NGOs, but it was taken up by government, by Fianna Fáil in particular, but also the Greens in government, but also by all the opposition parties. And it continued over uh, a change of government. It failed. It failed because of the global economic crisis, I would argue, um, and the decisions that were made in, in Brussels and in Ireland about how to respond to that, of course. Um, uh, 2008 saw, so nevertheless, even though it failed, it's really important to say it actually brought us the lowest level of homelessness we've ever actually formally recorded in 2008. So what it didn't achieve its goal, it had enormous successes. And it's really important to learn the right lessons from that. A number of people on the left and on the pro-homelessness side are at the failure of that and, uh, and point out to its failure and make, make a, 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 a big deal about it. I think that's the wrong position to take. I think that just creates anxiety and resistance amongst political leaders to try these things again. Um, I think the lesson from it is we need to plan better, we need to have better measurement, and we need to avoid global economic crises. And if we have global economic crises, we have to protect our housing and homelessness systems and our uh, disadvantaged and poor in a way that we failed to do in, in, the, in the last one. So, well, what is the pathway from where we are to having an objective of ending homelessness? I think it's really important to recognize that ending homelessness is not going to be easy and it's not going to be quick. Um, the Finnish program can be traced back over at least 20 years from when people started first thinking about that. I'm not saying we're going to have to wait for 20 years before we have results on this, but we really need to be realistic uh, if we are going to have this as a program to deliver rather than a set of rhetoric to make us feel good for a day or two. We don't need politicians or ministers or anybody or homeless organizations or homeless advocates to pick targets out of the air and just say, this is what we need to achieve by a particular point of time. But we do need targets and we do need milestones. We need to say we're heading towards a program which will achieve this over whatever number of years. And we need to say we're going to half it over this period of time. We're going to end family homelessness in this time. We're going to end youth homelessness in this particular time. And we need to agree what objectives we have and, and what we mean by those. So the things that, for instance, Paula was talking about in terms of women's homelessness and, and women fleeing domestic violence, to what extent are we including those in our homeless objectives? To what extent are we talking about traveler accommodation and, and other groups that tend to get lost out 
uh, get, get left out of, 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 of this debate. I don't think, I, I'm not saying that we can end up, that we're not trying to end in a position where there are no housing problems at all. We need to set a boundary by what we're talking about homelessness here. But we all need to understand what that is and buy into it as much as possible. And this approach, as I think you get the sense here, needs to be collaborative in its design, its delivery and its measurement. And it needs to be sustainable over several ministers and governments. And it was interesting to hear the minister earlier on talk about having a housing policy that would be able to be sustained over different governments. I'm not sure whether that's possible. The Housing Commission is an attempt to make an effort at that. But well, it is really it, almost impossible to see that because of the ideological differences between the different, different, different parties. I think it is possible to imagine an approach to homelessness itself, uh, which is capable of bringing in all the political parties. At the moment, it's so broken up that we, we lose momentum even between ministers from the same party in the same government in the changes that take place. And I think that-, yeah. that, that for, for my, Sorry? Uh, um, maybe another minute or so. Perfect. Yeah. Um, All right. So, thanks. Perfect. So the next stages in this campaign, what we need to do, do next. Well, Folk Zone's been running a campaign over this for the last number of months. We've got well over 10,000 signatures highlighting the importance of this. And we're going to be handing those to the leaders of the three government parties in, in the next couple of weeks. The minister has started this commitment to have this Houses for All strategy. We argue that homeless, ending homelessness has been named as the central organizing principle of that strategy. If it's not, if it's just, we want to reduce homelessness or we want to make it better for people, it will, it will not end homelessness. No country has managed to make significant inroads into the level of homelessness they experience without having the objective of ending homelessness as part of what they're going to do. We're not asking that the minister's new strategy should include the new targets, but it needs to set out a clear process by which those targets will be arrived at over, a very, over the, the, the rest of this year. It needs to contain a commitment to review the existing legislation around the definition of homelessness, about preventing homelessness, about recognising that families become homeless, about the fact that people have rights when they're homeless, rather than that it's all just to the discretion of the local authority. And crucially, and, and very relevantly to the whole theme of this conference, that whole approach of ending homelessness has to be underpinned by the, the understanding, the legislative basis and the constitutional basis that we understand that there is a fundamental human right to a home, which we recognise in Ireland, and we are going to mobilise our capacity as a society and as a state to deliver on. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, sorry. I, I, I didn't remind you that um, uh, you had uh, 20 minutes. Uh, sorry about that to have interrupted you. Um, but thank you very much. That's um, very insightful. Um, I hope this, uh, well, perhaps when we when um, uh, the next speaker finishes, um, we can uh, compare and see how, um, you know, how um, uh, we, uh, you know, Ireland can, what we can learn from Ireland for the, uh, from Finland for the four Ireland. And um, I, 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 it was interesting to um, hear you emphasize ending homelessness um, rather than managing it, because um, you know anything that is managed can be, can be it, it kind of sounds like patching up. Um, so we should ask ourselves then: um, Can we patch up, um, for example, uh, racism? Um, if we patch it up, um, is, would that end it? Um, can we patch up um, direct provision um, if we patch it up? So it's ending it, uh, ending homelessness. And uh, I, 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 I'll take that. Um, um, that that's, that's crucial to understand. Um, another thing that um, you mentioned there was the local connections aspect of providing intervention by local governments. Uh, I, I believe, I suppose that presupposes or assumes that all homeless uh, people come from a, a local area where they have long-standing connections, uh, perhaps going back to generations of their families, 
or you know a heritage to the the, the area um which excludes you know uh, you know like people like travelers uh, the new irish and other uh, migrants so that that was also interesting for me to to hear um thank you very much mike um for time sake um uh, we go on to the next speaker and uh, so we see if uh, we can have time for um questions after that and um, so i introduce now dr uh, sorry um, Sadia Turinen, um, as I said earlier, for those um, that joined after I introduced um, her, uh, she's a researcher, uh, research manager with the Y Foundation uh, uh, Finland. The Y Foundation is one of the key national developers of the housing first principle in Finland, and the Y Foundation offers affordable rental housing and are a leader in the eradication of homelessness. And prior to working with Y Foundation, uh, Sergio was a senior researcher with the Center for Excellence on Social Welfare in Helsinki. Uh, I welcome you now um, and I, I, I leave the floor open for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can uh, see my, my, my presentation there. And already, um, and thank you very much for for inviting me to to come and and speak here today. Um, yes, I've been a research manager in uh, in Y Foundation now for for four years. Um, um, I actually lived uh, for ten years, not that far from you, just across the wa water in in North Wales. I did my studies and my I worked for a while in uh, at the University of Bangor. In, in North Wales. So I've had some really good times also in, in Ireland, but please, that doesn't have to go on, on, on Twitter. Um, so um, I was asked to, to speak today about eliminating uh, homelessness in, in Finland. I will first talk about uh, the recent uh, developments. Uh, I will show you what the, the, the situation is today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about why we do what we do and uh, how we do it. Then we have a look at some things that have worked and also um, some challenges that we have faced and are still facing. And I will end my presentation with the critical elements that you need um, to, to eliminate um, homelessness from the, the Finnish perspective. Um, but firstly, I will uh, um, introduce very quickly um, my organization and um, our role in, um, in ending, ending homelessness in Finland. Uh, we are the fourth largest landlord in, in Finland. We both uh, build and we buy apartments. We've got about 17,500 apartments. Um, at the moment in total, and these include um, housing for special groups, uh, for example, people who are, are homeless or who are at, at risk of becoming homeless. Um, and also uh, this includes um, affordable rental housing. Uh, we are um, one of the key, as you said, we are one of the key uh, specialists in homelessness work. Um, we, for example, we um, coordinate the National Development Network on Housing First. Um, we are non-profit uh, and have no political affiliation. Um, we do advocacy work uh, both uh, nationally and internationally. We've got a, a fairly um, a new strategy with three key objectives. Um, the, the uh, social and economic well-being of our tenants and also the transition towards carbon neutral living. They're both very important to us, but uh, today I want to concentrate on the objective three, which is eradicating homelessness in, in Finland and also reducing it uh, internationally. And um, what this means uh, in, in, in practice, um, um, we want to, to eradicate uh, homelessness from Finland by 27. Uh, this uh, 2027 is not just a, a random number, it's exactly the same number that has been stated in our current government's program. Um, 
the other key element for in our current uh, strategy is the housing first model. Uh, it's been in our national strategies um, since 2008 and we want to strengthen and develop uh, our our way of implementing housing housing first. Um, I think this is the, the main reason why I'm here today. Um, for some years now, Finland has been the, the only EU country where the, the number of homeless people is on the, on the decline. Um, um, and also this is the reason why we wanted to highlight the international aspect uh, in our strategy. Uh, what I mean by this is that I, we want to take our lessons to, uh, we want to take our lessons abroad, but it, of course it's a two-way thing. We also want to learn from others because our, our work is not yet done. Um, here you see the, the, um, the development of, of 40 years. Um, we started our uh, more systematic data collection in, in 87. Every year we ask uh, our uh, municipalities, I think it is mid-November, we ask them to, to, to report back um, uh, what are the, the uh, number of homeless people in their, their services. Uh, you can also see there at the end how we should be doing to, to reach our goal and the, the recent uh, numbers from 2020 actually show that we, we need to speed up our work to, to get to, to zero homelessness by, by um, 27. Uh, we are also in the process of developing our data collection. This, um, uh, we are not doing it uh, in, on the ID level, um, but that's the aim that we should have a slightly more sophisticated uh, data collection system. Uh, in the next slide, uh, it's more or less the, the, the same message, but in, in slightly different uh, form. Uh, two things really from, from this slide I would like to, to highlight. The first one is uh, is that uh, it hasn't been the situation hasn't been that brilliant always in Finland either. Uh, we started with at least twenty thousand um, homeless in in eighty five. The number has probably been a lot higher before that. And uh, yes, uh, the number has gone down by um, almost eighty percent. But this is, you have to remember that we are now talking about what has been uh, taking place over 35 years. So this is not a, a quick fix, um, but it's a, it's a, a result of really um, um, persistent work uh, with heavy political backing. We, we, it, and it also takes, um, the, the list is long, it takes resources and uh, investments and structural uh, changes, coordination, cooperation. I will talk about all those in a minute. But before that, just uh, um, I wanted to show quickly uh, the details of our situations. Now, uh, so when we collect the data on, 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 the, on the homelessness or homeless people, uh, they include people who stay with friends and, and family, and they contribute about 70% of the total number, which, is, uh, which was last year, um, 4,300. Um, most of them are short-term hom homeless and about a quarter are long-term homeless. Our two first um, national programs uh, concentrated very, very heavily on, on, uh, on long-term homelessness and the, the numbers actually went down for over 10 uh, consecutive years, except 2020. And this is a very, very unfor unfortunate and uh, uh, sad uh, development that the, there was a slight rise on on, on long-term uh, homelessness in Finland. But at the same time, uh, if you want to find something 
I can't say positive, but if you want to find something um, for us to, to learn, I think it's a very good lesson uh, for us that uh, we can't just kind of rely that things keep happening because they happened uh, last year and years before that. Um, moving on to, to why uh, um, it makes uh, financial sense. Uh, there are two studies here uh, and uh, the one on the left looking at the, the the use of emergency um, health services, social services and legal services. They were looking at um, um, people five months and five, uh, before being housed and five months after being housed. And they found that there's a saving of 15,000 euros per person per head um, per, per year. Uh, the other study uh, also showed when they were looking, especially people recovering from mental health problems, uh, they noticed that the costs um, of, um, of services, so the costs went down by, by 34%, which was uh, slightly over 10,000 euros. Um, more reasons on, on, on why, um, and this is the, uh, a little history lesson now for you. Um, before our first national program um, was started, a, a small working group was put to, together to, to review the, the current situation in 2007 and also to, to make uh, suggestions of what needs to be done. And this was uh, focusing uh, on, on long-term homelessness. And it was a very interesting combination of people in the in the working group. There was a there was a, a bishop, there was a, a medical doctor uh, who was also a big time activist. Uh, then there was the head of social services in the in the city of uh, Helsinki, and uh, there was the CEO of uh, CEO of uh, Y Foundation at the time. And our current CEO was the the secretary of of the of the working group. Um, I would like to highlight two things from, from this slide. And uh, one is the, the, the quotation here that states, um, we can afford it. A civilized society leaves no one behind. I find this quotation um, quite uh, powerful uh, because uh, it, to me, it summarizes perfectly why why we are doing this, that we don't separate uh, us, uh, us and, and, and them. The, the other thing I wanted to highlight from this um, slide is that they, the report highlighted uh, three perspectives um, why the situation of uh, long-term homeless people in Finland has to be sorted out. And the first one was ethical perspective. Uh, and uh, it stated that human dignity uh, belongs to everyone. And as the, the theme today, it also says that home is a human right. The second perspective was legal. Uh, it is in our uh, constitution um, um, that who, who uh, anyone who is uh, unable to acquire uh, the necessary security for dignified life has to be uh, helped and has to be uh, supported. Uh, it, is also, uh, it is also in the law that uh, the public authorities have to provide not only health and social services, um, but they also have to promo promote um, everyone's uh, right to housing and uh, support people in, in arranging housing. And uh, I don't need to repeat this, but the third one was the, the economic um, uh, perspective that it makes um, financial sense to, to, to solve the, the issue. I think there's also a story behind the, the order of these things, but uh, uh, this is something I need to inquire a little bit more. Um, then moving on to uh, to how um, I just wanted to uh, say a few things uh, about how we understand uh, housing first in in Finland. The first one uh, has been said many times today: housing uh, 
we understand housing as a basic human right and a basic uh, social right. Um, um, apartments are, are always permanent homes and they are in, in no, normal surroundings uh, where, where anyone would uh, want to live. Um, sometimes we, we get offered a cheap land uh, to, to build uh, but we always refuse it because they are in, in areas where, where nobody wants to live. So why would we build them for, for, our, for our special groups? Uh, for housing, we've got different options. We got um, uh, scattered site housing, which uh, means that we buy apartments often in owner occupied uh, buildings, um, or then we have uh, supported housing units, but they are always independent rental apartments. Everyone has got their uh, bedroom, kitchen, bathroom, their front door with the, with the name, with their own name on the door. And the rental contract uh, is based on law. It's uh, it's always uh, it's the same contract that uh, I would sign. Uh, it has the basic uh, obligations and rights any tenant would have. Um, and then uh, another cornerstone of, of Housing First is a support. So support uh, if needed and if wanted, uh, but there is no underlying conditions uh, for, for either housing or for support. And then uh, finally, normality. Um, um, in, in Finland, our Housing First residents, they use the same mainstream services like, like anybody, anybody, and they apply for the same benefits like anybody would, uh, who needs uh, would apply. Uh, so, um, yeah, and if you want to know more about the, the housing, um, housing First principles that we, we um, apply in Finland, take a look at the Housing First Europe guide. Um, it explains in, in, in really fine and nice detail what each principle means in, in practice. Um, more about how, um, as I said, our two first national programs concentrated very heavily on, on, um, on the long term homelessness. And this is when the Housing First principle was introduced and also the approach of no more shelters. So we started to convert our shelters into supported housing. Um, after the two um, programs on, on, on uh, long-term home, homelessness, uh, we noticed that there are, are, are all the time new people entering, entering the unfortunate um, situation of, of becoming homeless. And we, we uh, created a third program uh, on, on prevention. And the current program we have now, it, it's very different. Um, um, it uh, has got much more local approach and the, the emphasis is really on the, um, giving more responsibility for the municipalities. This was, um, um, Oh, it has been quite slow starting, so we haven't got any results on, on this, this yet. So it remains to be seen how, how success, successful um, that program is. But we hope, of course, we hope for the best. I've mentioned the, the government program uh, now a couple of times. Uh, so our current government wants to, to halve uh, homelessness by 23 and ended by, by 27. Um, the second key thing uh, for us is uh, that they want to, to uh, increase the social housing quota in new uh, housing areas from 20 to, to 35 percent, which means also um, doubling it. Um, also housing advice or housing counselling um, the status will 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 change. That process is is almost almost there. Mike already mentioned this uh, about the the emergency um, um, accommodation and supported housing. So I just wanted before I show you some pictures of different housing options. Uh, I wanted to see the the developments in in Helsinki. This is not the whole of Finland, but Helsinki. 
which has about 60 percent of our of, of our homeless so you can see that in 85 on the right um when we talk about emergency shelters in 85 we had over 2000 uh, beds and now in helsinki uh, there is one emergency shelter uh, with 52 two bed places um and now in COVID-19, uh, because of the current situation, there there is some. Uh, they recently opened uh, at least one one emergency shelter for for young people. But the 52 is the the case in 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 normal circumstances. Also, then on the on the left, you can see that supported housing um, hardly uh, existed, and now we got uh, 13 uh, 13. Um, um, 100 flats. That number is probably higher because these uh, these uh, slides need uh, updating. But anyway, and you can see the kind of mirror image between these these two figures. And yes, scattered housing uh, was hardly um, hardly heard of. There were some some apartments in Helsinki, but now uh, I'm sure we are closer to, to 3,000 places. If in 2016 it was almost two and a two two and a half thousand places. But here are some uh, photos uh, of different housing options. Uh, the first one, Mike has probably been here. This is a, a very nice um, vinyl housing unit in Espo. Espo is a city right next to 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 Helsinki. It's a small um, unit uh, with uh, 33 uh, flats, independent flats, and um, Y Foundation owns the building. It's the city of Espo who chooses the tenants, and it's the Salvation Army who then provides the the, the support. And this is another kind of option that com uh, uh, housing that um, combines uh, different uh, options. Uh, it's a very new one uh, in uh, in uh, Järvenpää, again very close to Helsinki. I haven't been there yet because of the the current situation, but you can see that there is a supported housing first unit there for people who who need more support. Uh, for them, there's a day center uh, that organizes, for example, work activities, but in the same uh, courtyard, they've got um, affordable rental housing. And then in addition to that, they have uh, scattered site housing nearby. They call them uh, satellite apartments. So people in these apartments, if they need any support, they can come to the um, day center or, or the housing unit, or if they just want to, to participate in the activities, they're more than welcome to, to join the others there. So now moving on to, to um, what has worked. Uh, yes, we've uh, created permanent homes for over 5,000 people. Uh, there has been a systemic change from uh, shelters um, to, to permanent housing first uh, housing. We also have noticed that uh, small housing units like the Vinala I just uh, showed you, they work the best. Um, we also um, know that housing advisors have prevented thousands of evictions uh, every year. Uh, housing advisors now, you can find them in in most of the NGOs, all the cities have got them. Uh, I think we've got maybe eight uh, housing advisors also working in, in Wire Foundation. Yes, increasing social housing supply, it is increasing, but of course it's not increasing enough to, to our liking. Um, people with lived experience have played a, a key part. You probably noticed um, they were mentioned when I talked about the different um, national programs. They they um, play a key role not only in in planning, as it states here, but in, in at every level and in in all the activities that we do. So it's very much this uh, nothing about us without us approach, and it has um, given us extremely good results. Culture of collaboration. This is something I'm I'm. Um, extremely proud of when I talk about um, our work. 
Uh, I'm talking about now NGOs who, who compete for the same project money and they are in the same tendering processes uh, um, in, with municipalities. So they compete for the same resources, but at the same time, the mission and the vision of, of ending homelessness is so shared and that they they also work extremely well together towards the same goal. Also, one last thing about what has worked well is our um, uh, national um, Housing First National Development Network that is coordinated by by Y Foundation. Y Foundation, but uh, um, um, again, they they support the collaboration and uh, provide training amongst many other things. So what well, hasn't worked so well, um, the, the attitudes is, is one of the things. The change is not always uh, easy. Uh, time to time, we have to go back to, uh, to um, very basics. Why housing first? Uh, why not something else? Um, also, we know that more people need more support. Um, and the resources we have for support work in Finland are, is not adequate at all. We, we need more resources for, for that work. Uh, intensive case manage management has not always been intensive enough. Um, that relates to the previous point and also to the next point, meaning that the, the ba very basic social and health services in Finland to, to some extent are still in, in, um, in silos. So there is no integration between these services. Also, um, we are lacking uh, rehab places for, for truck users and desperate need for, for more places. Uh, not in my backyard also exists in, in, in Finland. Um, as I said, we want to build in, in good areas where, where everybody wants to, to live. And then you can imagine that the resistance in those areas can be quite fierce even sometimes. In, in Y Foundation, we, we started the planning process or started to apply for, for to be able to build, I think it was, was it 2014 or 16? And only this year uh, we have been able to start one building and we're talking about a housing unit for, for young people with very, very light support. Um, but that should be ready at the, the end of the end of the year this year. Then also uh, uneven development in housing first thinking and also practice how it's implement, implemented in different places goes back to also to the first point of, of uh, the attitudes. We constantly need to go back to the basics and do training on, on new people coming into the, the field and also people who have worked there for a, for a long time. It's very easy to go back to your old tricks. And then uh, I said that uh, what has worked, there is an uh, increase in, in social housing, but still there's very, um, there is a lack of uh, small affordable flats, especially in the, in the metropolitan area. So uh, now looking at a couple of uh, uh, critical points of, uh, of um, uh, what you need for ending homelessness. Um, um, housing first uh, has to be the mainstream uh, policy from from the Finnish perspective, and this needs yeah. political backing. Uh, sorry, Saida, just uh, just a minute now, just a round up. Yes, please. okay. And uh, this is just to summarize: we need permanent housing, uh, we need different options, uh, affordable housing, and then people need to have access to to housing benefits and general welfare system. And the um, uh, white partnership I already mentioned, but this is a bit what Mark, Mike was saying uh, earlier. We need, we need in numbers what we want to achieve by when. And also like don't make 10 year plan because it doesn't work. It takes a couple of years for, before anybody does anything. You need a shorter time span from the decision into execution. And just finally, I wanted to show you um, a couple of publications. If you want to know more about um, 
uh, how it was done in Finland more in detail, where the money came from and how much everything costs. You can uh, download the book, the home of your own book for free. And the other one is looking into um, homelessness in 2030. We asked international researchers to, to, to write short essays. And for further information, also in Europe, Housing First Europe Hub, um, Focus Island is one of the uh, founding partners and a key player. And now with the with the with the uh, new um, status of associates, we've also got um, Simon Communities respond and Paul from from Ireland. So um, thank you, Kitos. And if you want to 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 find find more or get more information. Don't hesitate to send me an email. I'm very happy to 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 reply. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Sage. I, I wish we could um, go go much longer, but um, time has run out on us. And um, thank you very much. Um, that was very insightful. And thanks very much as well, Mike. Um, these were very very insightful um, um, presentations, and um, and uh, I hope this awakens the spirit um, of uh, civic engagement in us all individually uh, to join campaigns um, such as the one um, by Focus Island and even uh, with our own Rory um, through various platforms to, to demand that housing is uh, responded to as a human right and a social um, right uh, and to ending uh, homelessness rather than um, managing it as Mike um, said. Uh, that quotation there stood out to me we can afford it a civilized society leaves no one behind um uh, that because that is the ethical thing to do and i hope um i hope um, that uh, we, we we all um um demand that and and um, make that come come uh, come through um in our society thank you very much um and and i, I wish you all goodbye Hello everybody, thanks and welcome to the next session we have today. This is going to be a very exciting um, down to earth with frontline workers talking about the discrimination. We're all aware that housing supply is a major issue in the housing current housing crisis, but there are certain groups have been negatively impacted by the housing crisis um, disproportionately so, and there are groups that are facing discrimination. Some of that open discrimination and some of it more subtle in discrimination by not providing appropriate housing. So I'm delighted today to have three people who can re represent groups that have been part of the most disadvantaged groups, people with a disability, people from the traveler community and people, migrant um, asylum seekers as well. So I think today has been, I think we'll all agree, a fascinating um, talk um, and it was great to from, uh, I work in the front, my name is Louise Bayliss, I work in the front line with Focus Ireland in the advocacy section as campaign coordinator. So, and as I'm also founding member and spokesperson for SPARC, which is Single Parents Acting for the Rights of Children. So from my own work, I can see the discrimination and how it impacts it. But I did really enjoy today to look at some of the overall macro issues and even about the financialization of the housing market and how that's impacting on us. Um, so one of the things that I want to remind you of now is that tonight there is going to be a screening of PUSH, which is how global finance is fueling the housing crisis and how do we push back. So I think that's going to put a very final end to the um, conference which is for today's event. It's a, it's a really circular motion because we started today's event with the financialization and affordable housing by Professor Manuel Albers. And I think this will really bring the issues back. But today, I'm really now at this stage, really excited to introduce our three guests. Rosemary, Rosemary Mon, who's from the National Traveler Accommodation, and James Cawley, who's from the Independent Living Movement. And, and I'm, I'm going to try, the, try to speak properly and get the name right, Bulani M. Fako, um, from, the, from the Movement of Asylum Seekers in Ireland. So I'm going to call on our first um, speaker, Rosemary Mon. She has been the tra National Traveller Accommodation Policy Officer um, since 20 2004, both locally, regionally and nationally. 
and she supports travelers to inform national policy impacting on lives while representing their needs nationally. So with no further ado, I'll pass it over to Rosemary and welcome Rosemary. Thank you very much, Louise. And it's an honor to be here um, representing the Irish traveler movement and of course travelers and the traveler accommodation crisis. Um, it's so important um, that in the space when we're calling for a home to be a human right, that traveler Pacific accommodation is included within that call because we know from our, our history within our country, travelers have and are still are resisting assimilation. And I think it's very important um, for people who may not have heard of the 1963 itinerary report to please read that because that is where um, the full force of assimilation started for, for travellers, where the state developed a state policy about us, without us, that specifically set out to absorb us into the settled community. And I think it's very important for the settled population to try to see the impact that, that would have on, on your soul. Try to imagine that if you uh, were the minority and that we were in power and that we forced you into trailers or into wagons or, or into a nomadic lifestyle, because that is what has happened to us. Um, and I think it's just so important that we are given that space in all these settings to talk about um, or travel accommodation crisis uh, and it's not to um i suppose to talk about um housing or any accommodation crisis to put it in, in a level of hierarchy but it's important to note and it's important to give travelers the space to say that there has always been a travel accommodation crisis within ireland long before there was ever a mainstream um, housing crisis and I think it's so important that as travellers, we're here today in solidarity with everybody in Ireland, every community who are victims of the current housing crisis within Ireland. Um, and I suppose just um, I'll try to go through my presentation within the time allocated. And I'd love um, if there were questions, at, um, if there was time for questions at, at the end, I'm pretty open as a traveller to answer whatever question that you have. Um, so I suppose I'll start off with who the Irish Traveller Movement are, for people who may not know who we are. We are a membership-led national uh, travel organisation. We were founded um, in 1990 and founded on um, the need to address the traveller accommodation crisis with, within 1990. And, the, and I suppose our struggle um, of resisting assimilation um, from the state and from wider society. We have a network of 40 local travel organizations and we work from community development principles. We develop collective policies um, from our local memberships who are, who are a settled partner, who are a partnership of travelers and non-travelers working together in the belief that travelers are an Irish ethnic minority um, who have a right to a home just like everybody else. In terms of our uh, ITM accommodation vision, our vision is that culturally appropriate accommodation would be provided uh, with families living in accommodation of their choice, and that includes nomadic provision. Um, as I mentioned, um, unfortunately, travellers have experienced long term institutional racism which has impacted greatly on our right to culturally appropriate accommodation. And unfortunately, in Ireland, um, a home is not outlined as a constitutional right, but a co we will see that a constitutional right to housing in Ireland would be a positive step in vindicating the rights of travellers and, uh, and other most impacted by the housing crisis within our country, whose rights who have been most violated in recent years due to the lack of implementation and the lack of delivery. It would provide a firm foundation for the realization of other rights and freedoms. And despite legislation in place for, for accommodation to travelers across the Republic since 1998, which was a, a direct result of the Irish travel movement and other travel organizations calling for such legislation. Um, and when we secured that legislation, we had high hopes travellers had high hopes that our struggle for our right to cultural accommodation and the struggle to, that we would no longer have to resist assimilation in our own country. We thought and we hoped that that would end, but unfortunately it didn't. And still today in 2021, we're still within that struggle. 
although Ireland has, does not recognise a home in, a in our constitution, it has, I suppose, signed up and ratified several international human rights treaties. And it's important that we are aware of that and we hold Ireland accountable to, to those while we're waiting for um, housing to be um, outlined as a constitutional right. Um, such treaties that they have we have signed up to is the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And if we look at Article 11.1, .1, the state parties to the, to the present covenant recognise the right of everyone to an adequate standard of living for himself and his family, including adequate food, clothing, clothing and housing, and to the continuous improvement of living conditions. The state parties will take appropriate steps to ensure the realisation of this right, recognising to this effect the essential importance of international cooperation based on free consent. The committee provided guidance on the conditions that must be met for shelter to be considered adequate housing, which are security of tender, availability of services, materials, facilities, and infrastructure, affordability, habitability, accessibility, and location in terms of employment, education, health, and social opportunities. And also very important for travelers, cultural adequacy. We know, unfortunately, sadly, travelers know too well that all those rights have been constantly denied to us. The right to housing within the constitution will provide a stronger basis for securing our cultural and human rights to culturally appropriate accommodation, which is why the Irish travel movement stands firmly in solidarity with everybody calling for the right to a home to be outlined and enshrined in the Irish constitution. So the traveller accommodation crisis, the, what has the, imp the impact been for travellers? Travellers' nomadic way of life has been diminished by the lack of provision of a long-term promised network of transient sites. Travellers are nomadic people. In 1995, the task force of the travelling people recommended 1,000 units of transient sites to be provided for families to be for tra traveller families to be nomadic. If we look around our country today in 2021, there is no transient network. Instead, travellers who try to be nomadic and hold on to our cultural aspect of being nomadic are served with unlawful, unjust evictions. Young traveller children trying to grow up to be travellers are witnessing at many times very violent evictions carried out by security companies and by the Gardaí. No child deserves to have that trauma so early in their life. Also, the lack of provision of traveller Pacific accommodation has also led and fed into what I would see the cultural genocide of travellers in Ireland. We cannot be travellers. We cannot be ourselves. Yes, on policy at a national level, on paper, there is a recognition that we were recognised as an ethnic minority group on the 1st of March of 2017, but that hasn't filtered down to travellers on the ground. We still are resisting assimilation. Yes, there are policies at a national level saying that Ireland will provide for a culturally appropriate accommodation, but in reality on the ground for travellers, that is not happening. And I suppose that leads me nicely into the trespass legislation, which came into play in 2002, which criminalizes travelers for being nomadic, which criminalizes us for being ourselves, which takes away our right, our cultural right to be nomadic, to be who we are, where we experience again, violent evictions given 24 hours notice to move but with nowhere to move to. And those who serve those evictions don't care where we go, don't care how many children we have, don't care that we don't have water, don't care that we don't have toilets, and don't care that we don't have electricity, and don't care about any of the health conditions uh, that we may have due to the, our generations of oppression. They just come and serve what I would see as an unlawful um, 
piece of paper, an eviction notice to a very vulnerable family. Sometimes it happens on a Friday evening at four o'clock and we will get the call and we have an hour to secure, try to secure legal representation for families within that space of time, which is a mission impossible. And unfortunately to this piece of legislation, there is very little defense. What happens is that travelers home, their trailer can, is taken and seized so the family are, are made homeless. Um, and if refusing, if they're in breach of this um, eviction notice, they can be fined up to 3,500 euros, and they also can be imprisoned for simply trying to be nomadic, for simply trying to be who they were born to be, a traveler. And on the other side of that is the lack of transient accommodation. Now, travelers would not be forced to stop uh, or camp in places where it may be deemed unsafe or where they might be on public land or private property, if there was that provision of the transient network that we were promised in 1995. Travellers have said they would use the transient network. They would pay for the use of the transient network. So where is our transient network? Where is our right to be who we are? Because a home comes in different sizes, shapes for travellers. There is nomadic provision, there's halting sites, group housing, um, and some families who prefer to live now in standard housing. But it's about having that right to choice and not to be assimilated, not to be assimilated in 2021's Ireland. If we look again at the impact of what the traveller accommodation crisis has meant for travellers, we talk so much today about the homelessness um, within Ireland. But travellers are overrepresented within the, the homelessness stats and the homelessness services. And yet we only make up under 1% of the entire population in this country. And that is quite concerning. That should be an international concern, but it's not even a national concern. Um, if we look at the stats, 11% of children in emergency accommodation in Dublin are travellers and 504 travellers in emergency accommodation in Dublin area alone. And that was taken for their latest stats in two, two, uh, 2019. And 23% of homeless families in Kerry were travellers, again taken from 2019. If we talk, and I'm so glad that um, in, in the Finland have taken the approach of addressing and counting um, hidden homelessness. And unfortunately, that's not happening in Ireland, but that needs to happen. And in particular, for traveller hidden homelessness. homelessness. We currently have 933 traveller families sharing accommodation nationally. They are homeless. They're living in damp and mould. They have lack of cooking facilities, often rat and fly infestations, insecure electricity, families living in day units, um, bleaky mobiles, lack of play areas for children. And as we're talking about unsafe uh, conditions, we must never forget what happened to travellers in Carrick Mines. We lost 11 of our people due to lack of delivery of traveller Pacific accommodation, due to travellers being left in unsafe, overcrowded uh, temporary accommodation. That must never happen again. It also has a severe impact on our mental health, our life expectancy and infant mortality rates, and also gives us a higher risk to COVID-19 because we are forced to live in situations that are overcrowded, don't have the space for self-isolation, don't have water, don't have toilets, and don't have sanitation. The basic rights that any person, um, human, deserves many traveller families don't have in 2021 and it took a global pandemic for families traveller families to get something as basic as water now that is a shame in any and on anybody's standards it should never have taken a global pandemic for anybody to get water if you also look at the unofficial sites where travellers are living we have 529 traveller families living in unofficial sites nationally. And again, many have little or no access to basic facilities, such as sanitation, electricity, and are vulnerable to evictions leading to homeless, 
I'm vulnerable to evictions because the lack of Pacific of traveller Pacific accommodation has been provided by the state and by local authorities for decades. So travellers, there's this stereotype or notion held within, within society that travellers choose to live this way. They choose to live in rundown sites or they choose to live down um, to live on the on the roadside. We are forced to live in substandard halting sites that have no water have no electricity. Some of the trailers may have holes on the roofs or, 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 on, or on the floors. People don't see that. People don't see the poverty that travelers are forced to live within. Nobody would live in these conditions unless they were forced to. So what caused the traveler accommodation crisis? Like the current crisis, it was lack of delivery. And in terms of travellers, it was lack of delivery of traveller Pacific accommodation. And it was lack of implementation of the 1998 Traveller Accommodation Act. In particular, no surprise into the delivery of culturally appropriate traveller Pacific accommodation. Low targets were set and were not met. Constantly, local authorities developed five-year traveller accommodation programmes from mm. 2000. No plans were implemented. They failed to meet their own targets. Travel accommodation budgets went on spent with the money sent back. What other community would that be allowed to happen to for decades with no sanctions, no accountability, no address as if travelers don't matter? But travelers do matter. And we need to hold local authorities and the state accountable. If we look at the budget from 20, for 2008 to 2019, 72 million went on spent by local authorities that could and should have been spent on culturally appropriate accommodation for travellers. Yearly, the budget is now close to 14.5 uh, million, but that should be reinstated back to the seven, back to what it was um, in 2000, which was over 120 million. And it should be ring fenced and it needs to be spent on culturally appropriate accommodation. Unfortunately, part of the traveller accommodation crisis is also the lack of political will and political opposition at a local level. The lack of national oversight and monitoring and the lack of accountability. And also the over reliance of the private rental sector which is alarmingly because that is standard accommodation. That is not traveler Pacific accommodation. And we know that travelers are 22, 22 more times higher, um, more likely to experience discrimination when trying to access the private rental sector, which again leads travelers into the homeless crisis. And there is very uh, little uh, provision of suitable housing to accommodate larger families which travellers on average have larger families than non-traveller uh, population. And also um, the European Social Charter breaches, people may be aware that in 2016, the European Committee of Social Rights found Ireland to be in breach of five grounds of the European Social Charter and in relation to the lack of provision of traveller or culturally Culturally, culturally appropriate accommodation. And in specifically to uh, eviction rights, it found that the Criminal Justice, which is the Public Order Act 94, as amended provides for inadequate safeguards for travellers threatened with eviction. And that the Housing Miscellaneous Provision Act 1992, as amended, provides for inadequate safeguards for travellers threatened with eviction and that evictions are carried out in practice without the necessary safeguards. And it reminded the state of its obligation in 2019, and we are still waiting to have them um, ramified. Rosemary, and also, can just, Rosemary, can I just say one minute wrap up, if you could? Oh, okay. Um, and I suppose just, uh, just to say that those evictions didn't, have, uh, didn't stop during the global pandemic, that travelers found themselves um, I suppose in a global pandemic, 
being evicted from place to place without the protection um, for COVID-19. And I suppose it's important just to wrap up on what are the solutions? What can end the traveller accommodation crisis? And firstly, just to say that the Irish Traveller Movement welcomes the Traveller Accommodation Expert Group, Expert Group Review and the 32 recommendations, which we see as crucial to ending the traveller accommodation crisis. There are um, set out in four categories, delivery, delivery and reflecting need. So we believe that we need an ethnic identifier in social housing across the board and homeless figures so that we can actually see the real need um, for travellers on the ground nationally. Um, and that must be reflected in a national audit of travellers' need and the current and future needs for travellers' uh, formations of families. In terms of governance, we are still calling and will continue to call for the National Traveller Accommodation Authority or agency, which will oversee and monitor the planning and delivery of traveller specific accommodation and hold local authorities and Ireland accountable to ensure that traveller specific accommodation is delivered. And also to repeal the criminal trespass legislation, which has criminalised travellers for being ourselves. And um, to, to restore the funding to, uh, to pre-recession uh, levels and also that network of transient sites that we were promised in 1995, that must become a reality for travellers. And that must become a reality because we're at a stage where we have resisted cultural genocide for generations in our own country. And that must stop. We have young travellers, we have young uh, traveller children, we have young old travellers that no longer can travel anymore, that our children don't know what it's like to be uh, nomadic because that aspect of our culture has been stolen for us. And we are here to claim that back. And I suppose in terms of planning, we're always hit with um, when we come to the part eight process, that local councillors will block traveller Pacific accommodation. Um, due to put maybe pressure from local residents or, pres or, for, or for other businesses, um, but not representing the needs of travellers, travellers in, the, in their area, travellers that they are elected to represent. Instead, they block our accommodation and use us as election bait. That would not happen to any other community, but it happens to us, and that must end. And that is why we are calling to take away the decision-making powers from local um, councillors around traveller Pacific accommodation. Because if we just look recently, it happened in Waterford, where traveller Pacific accommodation from across the board of parties was blocked. So how can we expect to have traveller Pacific accommodation provided and the travel accommodation crisis ended if people who are meant to represent us are blocking our right, our human right to a home? Thank you. Thanks very much, Rosemary. Um, that was very informative. I would like to say enjoyable, but it wasn't enjoyable. It was actually very uncomfortable listening to. And that's what it needs to be when we're talking about discrimination. We need to be brought into those uncomfortable spaces. And you very well outlined the lack of availability of appropriate accommodation. And that is the key, that all accommodation isn't suitable for all people, which brings me very nicely um, onto our next speaker, who is James Cawley. James Colley is the policy officer with Independent Living Movement, and I'm sure he will talk about appropriate accommodation as well. James joined the Independent Living Movement in August 2018. He graduated with a BA in Business and Geography and a Master's of Education. Previous to his role with the Irish um, Independent Living Movement, he was a secondary school a teacher and has done research on disability issues. And I welcome him here. Just to say, James, we're trying to keep it to 15 minutes a uh, talk because we are hoping to have an active um, question and answer session at the end. Thanks very much, James, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Louise. And no problem at all. I'll make sure I keep it in to 15 minutes. Um, it was absolutely fantastic to hear Rosemary speak there as well and to give her insights as well on um, uh, housing and accommodation for, for travellers as well. So I suppose I just want to start off by saying a big thank you to Dr. Roy Hearn and the Department of Applied um, Social Studies at Maynooth for inviting me to speak at the third annual uh, housing conference um, hosted by Maynooth University today. So I'm delighted to be here along with an array of academics, policy makers and activists in the area of homelessness 
and housing. Uh, I suppose by way of introduction, as Louise said, I am the policy officer with Independent Living Movement Ireland, or ILMI. Uh, I'm also a young, relatively young, uh, proud disabled man who grew up in rural County Longford. Uh, I'm a son, I'm a brother, a husband, a friend, a colleague, and I suppose I'm, I'm an ally to see an Ireland where all people um, have a place to call home. So inevitably, I will bring lived experience today, but also I'm here um, representing a movement of a movement of disabled people um, from across impairment basis across um, Ireland. And just before I start uh, to say, uh, I feel very much, or before I start into that, I feel very much at home today um, because I'm a proud Maynooth University alumni as well. I uh, spent many years there as well, uh, studying to become a teacher. And I work locally there in the school as well. So I fully integrated into the community there. And I suppose my mother quite often still says, Maynooth was like your second home, uh, been integrated into all aspects of the community there in Maynooth as well. So I think that's important to note that the home is, a, is around a sense of community uh, as well. So I suppose, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I'm policy officer with ILMI, we are a, a national campaigning representative uh, across impairment and um, disabled persons organization or DPO as defined under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities or also known as UNCRPD. Uh, it's important to note we are led by and for disabled people and we promote the philosophy of independent living and we seek to build an inclusive society. I suppose central to the way that we work then is to ensure that all the policies that impact on the lives of disabled people have to be directly influenced by those whose lives are directly affected. And in this case, it's obviously um, disabled people. Our um, philosophy then can be summed up um, as nothing about us without us and rights not charity. So we're simply asking for disabled people to be consulted with and to be engaged with and to recognize us as contributing members of society. Because for far too long in Ireland, disabled people have been talked about and not talked to. So we need to involve us disabled people in all conversations going forward. We need to see disabled people um, in representation across all structures at a national, uh, regional and local level. Um, I suppose Isle of Mine has a vision for an Ireland where disabled persons have freedom, choice and control in all aspects of their lives and where disabled people can fully participate in society as equals. But again, traditionally in Ireland, you know, disabled people or disability have been seen from a medical model uh, where, where this kind of um, individualizes um, our impairments. But at LMI, we view disability from the social model of disability. And we believe it is the inaccessible policies, the structures, the inaccessible housing, inaccessible, inaccessible transport systems, for example, that disable us. Hence, we use the term um, disabled person. So with that in mind, um, independent living means lots of things um, for us at ILMI. It means having the same choices as everyone in housing, transport, employment, um, and uh, also to be able to engage in social, economic and political life, but also to get a job, to have family, uh, and to participate and have your goals and dreams. But also um, independent living is about linking the pieces of the independent living jigsaw together. And often for many disabled people, that can be best achieved by the employ employment of personal assistance services and support such as assist assistive technology or other supports that are appropriate and adequate for, um, for disabled people to live a life of their choosing. But I suppose before I go into the issues disabled people face in relation to housing, I think it's important to give a very brief policy context, and I will be very brief in relation to that. Um, but I suppose the National Housing Strategy for People with Disability is the current strategy to, to house disabled people. Uh, and this was, you know, 2011 to 2016, and it was a policy developed against the backdrop of a number of policies. Um, namely the Disability Act 2005, the Housing Miscellaneous Provision Act 2009, and a time to move on from congregated settings. And I suppose this is the policy that was, you know, one of the main drivers um, for housing for disabled people in Ireland. And of course, in 2018, we were ratified the UNCRPD, uh, or the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities in Ireland. And one particular article within this convention that's really particularly important here is Article 19 around independent living. And this article simply summed up 
recognises that disabled people have the right to live in and be part of and use services and amenities in their community communities and they should choose where and whom they live with with appropriate and adequate supports and I think that's really important that it's appropriate and adequate for the person but anyway if we look at that national policy then the housing strategy for people with a disability 2011 to 2016 it was extended and rolled over um, to 2020 and rebuilt in Ireland and it will come to an end this year I suppose the vision and aims of the national housing strategy um or to achieve a coordinated and integrated approach to meeting the housing needs of disabled people at a local level. And one of the main things from this was that housing disability steering groups were developed, also known as HDSGs. And these were tasked with preparing local strategic plans on housing disabled people for a county or a city area um, to write to how they would aim to house disabled people. So in 2019, ILMI um, conducted its own research and we analysed all of these plans, um, identifying a large variation in the plans across the, the counties and the local authorities. And indeed, I'm happy to share that submission with anyone. I'll pop my email address into the, the chat function as well or send it on to Dr. Um, Royal Hearn and you can send it out because it, there's, obviously it won't get time to go through that today. But as part of that research, we conducted consultations then with our members um, across Ireland and we identified key issues in relation to housing for disabled people. And some of the key ones were that housing choice for most disabled people in Ireland is severely limited due to our accommodation needs and that the home needs to be the priority and to source supports around the person to live independently. So I, that idea of the pieces of the jigsaw have to fit in order for the person to live in a home. So they need a person, they might need a personal assistant, they might need assistive technology or whatever uh, supports are appropriate. And unfortunately at the moment in Ireland, those uh, pieces of the jigsaw are not completely linked up and there needs to be more joint up thinking around how um, supports can link to allow a disabled person to live with choice and dignity and respect in their lives. I suppose how the needs to be seen as a right and disabled people need to be seen in broader um, housing discussions around housing and homelessness. So, for example, while there is housing disability steering groups, it's very difficult to see was disabled people involved on those structures. And I suppose ILMI as a DPO now have been calling on uh, all those housing disability steering groups to have lived experience there. Um, and that's something that we will uh, continue to work at. And uh, we, we will see that lived experience is going to be on those structures locally. And that inevitably will work nationally up the way and down the way as well and see disabled people in all representational roles um, going forward, which is really, really important. Another important one to remember is that um, very few homes in the private market are accessible and lack of accessible units impacts disabled people. And I suppose if you work and earn over a certain amount as a disabled person, you don't qualify for a local authority house. And this means that you have to go to the private rented market. And that's like finding a, a needle in a haystack trying to find an accessible home in the private rented market. While homes are accessible, sometimes the location is not. So again, not integrated into the in this community. So this can lead to situations where disabled people have a home but without the specific support such as, you know, a personal assistant or um, accessible transport, you can become stuck in that home and institutionalised in that home. So it's important that we realise that, that disabled people don't become isolated in an area that's not accessible. It's all right, as I said, having the four walls, but not being able to move outside of those four walls um, in your community, that can be quite um, damaging as well. Um, then as well, another big issue for disabled people is uh, many disabled people who want to live independent lives are caught in a, as I say in virtual commas, catch 22 situation. So in order to get a home from a local authority, they need to have a commitment from the HSC to have a support package in place, whatever that might be, whether that's a PA or whatever other support package. But the HSC, for example, will not sign off on a package then unless there's a home to move into. And people find themselves caught in a kind of two bureaucratic systems then that don't seem to communicate. So a call for a more um, joint up thinking around that would be fantastic. Of course, we've heard um, throughout today as well, many disabled people are the hidden homeless. They either live with loved ones or are inappropriately placed in institutions. Um, um, and housing um, is not even considered for those, those uh, disabled people. And you know, um, it's kind of seen that disabled people then when they live with loved ones, they have a roof over their head. 
but quite often that's not with choice and it would be lovely and a, a human right for disabled people to have choice and dignity and respect to live in their own home and going uh, forward as well. So I suppose just to leave you with it then, going forward, what does it mean um, in relation to housing or what should housing look like? So housing should be about choice and it should be about inclusion and the freedom of movement. How, housing needs to be um, linked to accessible transport and real social inclusion, inclusion, including access to support such as personal assistance services or supports that are adequate and appropriate to the person's needs. Otherwise, the independent living jigsaw does not fit. Disabled people need to be part of these conversations going forward and we need to be seen in representational roles at all uh, structures and levels at the national, and regional and local level. It's important just to say as well that, you know, a new strategy, new national housing strategy is now being um, developed and the strategy is about facilitating the provision of housing options and related services to disabled people to allow individual choice and support uh, for independent living. Um, the consultation on the current housing strategy ends tomorrow and um, so I'd urge everyone um, in relation to um, the, the, the consultation on the current strategy, uh, the deadline is tomorrow, so I'd urge everyone to go to www.housingagency.ie and fill out that um, consultation um, to get to be heard and to get your voice in there. Um, and then it's important to note as well that a further round of consultation on the drafted aims and objectives will be carried out over the summer and autumn months for the new strategy. And I would encourage again, everyone to be involved in the development of that new strategy for disabled people. And finally, I'll just I suppose leave you with this note that as well, remember housing is not just about building homes, but we need to think about building genuinely inclusive communities because we always need to think about making that jigsaw fit. So, around housing, transport, employment and personal assistance services in order for disabled people to fully be involved into uh, independent living and to have choice and control in their lives. So um, thanks so much again to Manith University for uh, inviting me along today and um, I look forward to the questions afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank, thanks very much James, again a very informative thought. A talk. It really brought home the idea that it, uh, housing isn't just the four walls, that we need the full supports around it, just as Rosemary's point was, that there's appropriate accommodation um, and capacity around the, the actual supports needed to live in what's suitable for all, and what four walls aren't just the same for every individual, and that all housing needs assessments should be based on an individual need rather than just what um, the housing or councils tell us we should need. So I really appreciate your informative talk, and I'm sure there'll be loads of questions for you um, afterwards now as well. Um, I'd now like to um, remind people, if they can remember, that we're looking to have this going up on Twitter again, if you are a Twitter person, um, if you can use the hashtag home and human right, get this trending again. And I'd love to introduce now Bulani M. Fackel. Um, Bulani is an activist from the movement of asylum seekers in Ireland. He grew up in the apartheid ghetto of Kalitsia in Cape Town, um, and he became involved at an early age in protests for adequate housing and access to land. In 2017, he claimed asylum in Ireland after completing a master's here. He's seeking protection from violence and targeted killings of LGBT plus people. He's one of the spokespeople at Maasai, and we're delighted he's here today to talk um, about his campaigning work around the right to have work for all asylum seekers, housing, and, his, and, and a, a call that I'm sure we all agree with here is the end direct provision. Um, Bilani, welcome. And again, I'd ask you if you could keep to the time limit just so that we can um, have an active conversation afterwards and, and welcome. Um, good afternoon and thank you uh, for inviting me to the conference. Um, I'm very briefly there. Thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, the movement of asylum seekers was formed by asylum seekers in 2014, mainly to campaign for an end to the system of direct provision, uh, but also to campaign for the right to work and an end to the deportation regime. Uh, one of the things that uh, spurred on the formation of MICE was, of course, the squalid conditions that asylum seekers uh, found themselves in. Uh, when the government uh, in Ireland introduced the system of direct provision, for instance, they started uh, uh, by removing asylum seekers from ordinary housing supports. Asylum seekers in Ireland were entitled to the same supports uh, that Irish nationals are entitled to when it comes to housing um, and welfare entitlements. 
um, but all of that uh, ended the day that direct provision was uh, introduced. It was rolled out in April uh, of 2000. Um, and since then, asylum seekers have been uh, uh, crammed into uh, direct provision centers where um, conditions are basically unsuitable for them to live one dignified uh, lives that respect their right to privacy, but also the, the, the right to family to exist as a family. For a, a, a brief period, I, asylum seekers in Ireland were actually forced, uh, families were forced to share intimate living spaces with strangers and still are in some direct provision centers. As early as 2017, when I was in Balsaskin, there was a family there that was forced to share a bathroom with strangers living in the room next door. Uh, and one of the, the, the parents uh, had to stand at the door because the son uh, was terrified of using a, a shared bathroom. And so every, every time the, the, the little boy went into the bathroom, the mother would have to stand at the door um, and keep watch. Um, uh, silly enough, the, uh, uh, the, the, the girl in the, in, in the family was not scared of using the bathroom. Um, it was the little boy who was terrified um, uh, and she, she used to make fun of her brother for being scared of uh, going into the bathroom alone. But it was sad that you had a, a family in that situation where they didn't have the right to uh, privacy um, and had to share intimate living spaces with strangers um, in that setting. Um, again, uh, some of the direct provision centers would be hotel uh, type of accommodation where an entire family unit is stuck in one hotel room uh, for many years. And uh, if you look at lives in limbo, which was a series that was done by uh, the Irish Times interviewing asylum seekers who shared their experiences of life in direct provision, similar to uh, accommodation for homeless uh, people who, who spend a long time in emergency accommodation and in family hubs. Uh, we've also had cases of people in direct provision uh, dying uh, because of mental uh, inadequate mental health support. Um, uh, uh, for instance, in 2016, uh, a child in a direct provision center in Cork, a six-year-old boy, went outside to play with uh, uh, his friends and wanted to show his friend something in the room, went to the room, knocked, the mother didn't open, asked security to open the room and the security found his mother dead. Um, uh, an inquest revealed that the mother had died by suicide. And so mental health issues for asylum seekers um, are, 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 are acute. Uh, there's an acute need for uh, uh, mental health supports because people have suffered deeply traumatic experiences before having to flee their homes and some experience trauma while fleeing. So you can imagine people, for instance, who had to travel uh, by sea, who go through the Mediterranean, uh, would have experienced traumatic experiences that other people who fly um, into Dublin airport don't experience. Um, uh, she wasn't the first person to die in direct provision by suicide. There are many others who've died before her and there are others who've died after her. Um, uh, Again, one of the fundamental uh, issues that we would have as a movement of asylum seekers in Ireland with the system of direct provision is the segregated nature of direct provision. As I mentioned earlier, that asylum seekers were uh, treated like Irish nationals in terms of getting houses. So you, they literally had the same pa housing payments that was given to asylum seekers before uh, the introduction of direct provision. Um, you could go into your local authority and get uh, uh, assistance to uh, a house, basically. Um, uh, now that never uh, happens uh, because the, uh, the state decided to contract uh, the provision of accommodation for asylum seekers to private companies who have made uh, millions and millions um, uh, through the system of direct provision and they are paid uh, per person so they're not paid for the room that they have. Um, I'm speaking to you now from a room in Nokleshin Direct Provision Center and I share it with one other man. Um, they are not paid for uh, uh, the actual space, physical space that we have. They are paid for both of us being here. Uh, and that means that the operators of direct provision centers in, uh, uh, in situations where before the pandemic, you had as many as eight men in one room, the company with, was being paid more than 8,000 euro at minimum for that one room that was shared by eight men. And that for us to represent another problem in that they are not looking at the needs of the person. They're not looking at the, the rights of the person, the right to privacy, the right to dignity. They're not considering what life you would live uh, uh, as a person in that environment, um, but just looking for a way to give you a, a roof over your head and tick a box and to say that we've provided you with a roof over your head and three meals at the end, therefore you should be satisfied with it. It also presents a uh, segregation for us because asylum seekers were not just removed in terms of policy from ordinary provision of housing, but they were physically removed. Previously, asylum seekers could choose 
to live anywhere in the country, uh, but not anymore. When the right provision was introduced, it meant that asylum seekers would be shipped around the country from one part to the next at the will of the bureaucrats with no say um, uh, on the matter. Um, uh, uh, we only treat livestock like that. If you have a cow, you don't go and consult your cow um, to say that you are moving it to a different farm. You just move it. Um, we don't treat uh, human beings like that, but that's asylum seekers are treated like that in Ireland. Again, Asylum Archive, good project done by uh, a former asylum seeker who used to live uh, vocation, who used to live in a direct provision center. He documents direct provision centers past and present. So if you want to have a look at what the different conditions um, in direct provision are, you can go to uh, Asylum Archive. One of the important things to note here is that for a very long time, there were no standards in direct provision. Standards were expected to be, national standards for direct provision were expected to be enforced um, at the start of January of 2021. So more than 20 years later, they started talking about standardization. So conditions have varied across direct provision centers. Some would provide, for instance, uh, uh, with access to cooking facilities, but most uh, was not provided at all. People had to uh, eat uh, food in the canteen and still have to eat in the canteen. When I'm done with this call, I'm going to the canteen and go get my meals. Even in the middle of the pandemic, we have to go and congregate in the canteen to get our food. And you wonder why there are recurring outbreaks of COVID-19 in direct provision. That is mostly, you would remember, is a holiday home and some of the uh, accommodation uh, that is used for direct provision would be old guest houses, some uh, abandoned schools uh, have also been used, but also the old convent in Balihon is, um, is used as a direct provision center. Um, overcrowding a big problem, especially before the pandemic. Um, they've reduced it during the pandemic. They hired uh, uh, hotels um, and took people uh, and said that they would not have more than three people in a room, but we still have outbreaks of COVID-19, even if the room is shared by two people, because you're essentially putting two single strangers who have their different lives and who all go about their lives differently. My roommate has no idea where I am right now, and I have no idea where he is. He could be uh, 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 coming back with COVID-19 or I could bring in uh, COVID-19 and he would have no control over that this is because he can't uh, observe social distancing when you share communal bathrooms and communal uh, toilets and have to go and congregate in the canteen, for instance. One of the things they did was to shut down direct provision, cent uh, direct provision center when there was somebody testing positive, but they stopped that um, uh, due to the protest that broke out in uh, Kahisa and in Kerry when they had an outbreak of COVID-19. Very brief lessons for Ireland in terms of housing um, and how not how, how to do housing and how not to do housing. You could learn from the Republic of South Africa. Irene Khrushchev uh, was a, a housing uh, rights activist in South Africa. Um, she was a single mother. She lived with uh, her children um, uh, in a home, in somebody else's home. So she was uh, uh, what we call a backyard dweller, um, uh, living in somebody else's backyard. Um, there were uh, hundreds of other people in her, in her situation, in her community, and they decided to occupy an open piece of land that was owned by the government, um, uh, which was near their community. And they built, started erecting their own shacks um, in that piece of land. Um, the government, of course, came and evicted them from the piece of land uh, uh, because they, well, it was uh, the government said, um, uh, the land was going to be used for housing anyway, um, uh, but they they evicted them without giving them an alternative um, as to their accommodation needs. Um, and a lot of them would have been on a housing waiting list in South Africa, which can run up to 20 years, uh, or you can spend as long as 20 years in the in the housing list. Um, uh, uh, and so uh, after that eviction, Irene Khrushchev challenged the government in the court and said, well, um, I have a constitutional right um, to have access to adequate housing, and it is found in the South African constitution, which makes clear provisions for uh, uh, many socioeconomic rights, including the right to housing. Um, uh, uh, and she felt aggrieved by that the government had evicted her with her children, uh, who have an unqualified right to shelter in the South African constitution. Um, and so she took them, uh, the government to court, um, uh, uh, for the reasons that uh, they are evicting her, um, uh, which is again forbidden in the constitution. You can't evict a person without an order of the court in South Africa. The constitution makes that very clear. Um, again, they were not providing her with the housing um, and they're also not providing her with temporary housing 
how well the way I did he had. And that was with three uh, issues that were raised in the, in the challenge. And she was excluded from government uh, 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 program, uh, from the government program for building housing in South Africa at the time. She wouldn't have met the, uh, the, 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 the criteria for the national government as program. And so it went to the constitutional court and the court ruled actually first in the high court, the high court ruled in her favor and agreed with her that she had an unqualified right to, uh, uh, to housing because her children's right was unqualified. Um, and the court said then, uh, the high court was of the of view that if you present uh, uh, for a housing need in the local authority, you should be given a house on demand because if you have a child, that means the child's right to shelter is unqualified. Um, the constitutional court disagreed that the, you should have a house on demand um, because the constitution uh, in South Africa says you have, the government has to then take into account uh, uh, reasonable uh, uh, and available resources in providing that uh, uh, housing. Um, and so, although the court ruled in her favor, it disagreed with the uh, ruling of the high court that the house should be provided to you on demand. Um, the constitutional court uh, uh, found in her favor that the state did, does have a positive obligation to provide uh, a shelter. So for since 1996, South Africans knew that they had a constitutional right to housing, but they didn't know how to uh, actually claim that right. Uh, uh, the state uh, uh, was uh, arguing here that we actually don't have an obligation uh, to provide you uh, with a house, but we do have plans to ensure that uh, one, we would source land, uh, build a dwelling and provide security of ten. And the court simply made those plans the order um, uh, 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 in that in, in that judgment, um, uh, and so they ordered the state to source land to build a dwelling and to ensure security of ten or four people, like um, Irene Hutboom, which revolutionised the provision of housing in South Africa because the government could no longer claim that it didn't have an obligation to provide a person uh, with a house. The difficulty then, um, uh, of course, is uh, uh, the, the the limitation imposed by resources. How do you that the the court assess that, for instance, when it comes to a case when a person goes to the, the court and claims that the state has not provided uh, them with the house because the state says it doesn't have the resources to do so. The, 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 the court then said that it would depend on whether or not the state's actions were reasonable. Um, but whatever the, the, the state, the, whatever, whatever action the state takes, it must ensure that there is temporary accommodation provided for a person who is not uh, able to provide it for themselves. Um, and that temporary accommodation must uphold the right to privacy, um, uh, internally and externally. Internal privacy means that the uh, children wouldn't be sharing a bedroom with their uh, uh, parents, for instance. Uh, and external privacy would mean that, of course, um, uh, it is not shared with other strangers, um, which was a very big deal for South Africans because um, quite a lot of housing developments before that judgment in the year 2000 um, uh, were built, it was literally four walls. Um, uh, uh, how you decide where a bedroom is within that four walls is up to you. Um, there was no uh, compartment to, uh, to say this is a bedroom or this is a, a, a kitchen and the, and the bathroom was actually outside. Um, and so for a very long time, uh, South Africans didn't know how to exercise or to claim that right. Um, it took that uh, constitutional court ruling to change the way the government provided homes. Um, uh, it entitled for the first time uh, South Africans to an actual home. Um, uh, South Africans who could not provide themselves with a home um, were then uh, entitled to a home. Um, uh, and the government decided that it would provide a two bedroom home to every uh, South African who earned less than, the last time I checked it was less than 4,200 rents. I don't know how much that is in Europe, but it's an epitome, I can tell you that. Um, and so the other problem, of course, was that in the government plans, the house that you get does not take into consideration the family size. Um, and so that would be another lesson for Ireland if you wanted to go by uh, uh, to have a constitutional uh, right to housing, you would have to consider the actual provisions in that because the, the state wanted to argue that it didn't have uh, an obligation to uh, to build a dwelling for an individual, 
um, uh, well, even if the constitutional right was there. Um, and so it, requ it required a lot of effort in terms of campaigners um, who had campaigned for years for, uh, to claim the right to housing. Um, uh, uh, and those campaigns um, fell on deaf ears because a lot of people who were in, uh, 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 in government um, at the time um, were of the view that, you know, we can't continue building our homes and giving them to people basically because that's what it meant for millions of South Africans who didn't have a job um, and unemployment uh, it was uh, very high and it's still high today. There are 9 million unemployed South Africans um, who can't find work um, and they will have no hope of ever finding work um, uh, uh, because a lot of them actually would have been a, a part of a generation that was excluded from accessing uh, education. Um, and so you can imagine those difficulties with uh, people not being able to then uh, uh, find homes. And that ruling from the Constitutional Court for us signified um, uh, to the state, um, uh, and it still holds to this day um, in other rights as well, such as the right to health care, signifies that socioeconomic rights can actually uh, be justified, justiciable. So you can go to the court and claim them uh, when the state uh, does not uh, meet the, uh, its obligation uh, to provide uh, uh, for the housing. In wrapping up, they built um, uh, a number of housing uh, uh, options for South Africans, uh, but the most popular one would be RDP housing, what we call RDP housing, uh, which is the two bedroom house that is given to a person who cannot afford uh, for them. And then for people who can afford to pay, um, they would have rented accommodation to uh, uh, their local councils, or they would be assisted to buy, they would have a subsidy towards buying uh, a home. Um, and it would be means that test, uh, uh, assessed based on their, their income. Um, so for the, diff uh, the supports would be provided based on how much you earn um, and you lose it after 15,000 rent, which is again in a pittance of less than a thousand euro. So you don't get any uh, amount if you earn more, uh, more than 15,000 South African rent. Um, because you can afford to purchase a home in the rental market um, as an individual or as a uh, joint income um, if you earn that much. But the biggest uh, uh, victory for housing campaigners in South Africa has been that the government had a positive uh, 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 obligation to provide. And that was enshrined uh, uh, in the constitution and that people could actually claim that right. Um, uh, and a key component in the constitutional court judgment was that the government was ordered to one, source land, uh, build a dwelling and ensure security of tenure for the people so that people don't end up being evicted or homeless again uh, after being provided uh, with home housing assistance by the state. The government says um, uh, now, the current minister says that they uh, can't continue providing uh, free homes to impoverished South Africans. Um, they will give people land uh, and people will have to build it themselves. But from past experience, uh, has shown us that when you give uh, a poor South African piece of land, uh, when they can't afford to buy bricks and uh, the concrete to actually build a proper house, um, it means that you are just going to encourage um, uh, those slums that you see in the picture there. Um, uh, uh, people will still be left out in the need of uh, uh, a proper housing. So I don't think the ministers uh, plan to do away with the home building um, in South Africa at the moment will uh, uh, be one be accepted by the public uh, because we have a very uh, uh, active civil society group such as Abashali Basim Jondolo, which is a, a movement built by people um, who are homeless, uh, uh, who uh, many of whom live uh, in slums, have organized themselves over the years to challenge the government's refusal uh, 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 or inadequate provision of housing. Um, so much so that the government today has built more than three uh, housing units um, and given them to people uh, 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 who were previously impoverished and had no means of providing it for themselves. Um, uh, the need, of course, is always greater, but there are lessons there to learn that even if the constitutional right is written in the constitution, um, it, it will be uh, useless if the government does not recognize that it has an obligation to provide uh, housing. And so the provision in the constitution would not be a simple one-liner that everybody has a, a constitutional right to housing, but it actually uh, 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 impose, uh, needs to impose an obligation to uh, one source land, uh, build a dwelling, and actually ensure uh, security of tenure for the people who would be beneficiaries uh, of that housing program. Otherwise, you go back to square one where you have to argue with politicians around housing development, 
um, and the bickering, uh, the back and forth bickering that goes on uh, when it comes to allocation of resources. Um, so for the first time after the Khurtum judgment, uh, South Africans could actually rest assured that their government uh, would work towards uh, ensuring that they have uh, 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 housing provision um, is part and parcel of government policy program, uh, but also that the government is seen to be building uh, homes, not just abdicating responsibilities to the private sector as it has happened in Ireland. If we could just wrap it up now, that would be great. That, that oh, would be perfect. That I wanted to say, of course, was that perfect time. housing in Ireland, uh, in South Africa, it wasn't provided at all for uh, people of my uh, migrant backgrounds. So uh, you needed to be a South African in order to get any form of housing support um, uh, in South Africa. And that would be similar to what uh, Ireland has today. Thank you very much, Julani. And, and again, a very um, in uncomfortable talk but needed to be uncomfortable and um, some of the discussions around the provision and eight people in a room and even now that you you, you um, are still sharing a room where you've no control over your COVID-19 very interesting insights um, and really enshrines why it's so important for us to ensure there isn't discrimination against the housing uh, housing market I think um, the whole theme of today about discrimination has really uh, pull together some of the core beliefs we have about housing as a human right. And Bolani, I think some of the lessons you have said about putting it into the constitution is one thing, but implementing it is another thing. And that's very important for us now at the moment when we are about to hopefully head, head into a referendum that will be doing addressing those issues. So thank you very much for bringing that in. I just want to remind people of to, again, I know it's been a long day and people are probably tired of looking at a computer screen, but you can cast, um, your laptop to the big screen TV and watch the push, how global finance is fueling the housing crisis and how do we push back? You can sit and watch that and turn off your camera, turn off your microphone, and it can be just a nice way to end the evening if you're still interested in doing that. I just have a couple of questions in the comments that I just wanna go through. So Colette Spears said uh, that um, families living in substandard sites or even living in substandard sites now, just as Rosemary said. So even if they are official sites, they're still, a substandard and I think that's some of the points that Bulani and well I suppose all three panelists have made Rosemary, James and uh, Bulani that just because the provision is there it doesn't mean it's adequate. Thomas Erbsler has a very specific question for you Rosemary and it's has the establishment of the joint, joint policing committee added to the difficulty of roadside travellers in other words are, are councillors and the police now working to move on travellers and is that adding to your difficulties? And then people were just looking for the website from James, but you share that now, James, so I appreciate that. And, and then Karen Till, and just I'll let you then answer this question, Rosemary, but Karen Till just brought up about your talk, um, Bulani, and just said that it, one of the great articles would be to share would be Irish Times Lives in Limbo. And she said that'll give them more detail about the, um, the realities of direct provision. So she just directed people that. So Rose, maybe you wouldn't mind just answering the question from Thomas about the roadside travellers and, and the Joint Policing Committee. And I think we'd be ready to close. Then I might introduce um, Rory then to do a final closing. Perfect. It's actually a, a very good question from Thomas. And unfortunately, in some parts of the country that actually has served the purpose, um, I suppose, of the local authorities and the Gardaí to victimise travellers, vulnerable travellers on the roadside who are homeless, who don't have access to transit accommodation, and to use that legislation that I mentioned, the, the criminal trespass legislation, which criminalises travellers for being nomadic. Um, so, like, I think it's really about Ireland and our allies to join us in the call to have that piece of legislation repealed and to join us in the call to have our cultural um, accommodation rights no longer breached, but to be afforded to us as the Irish travellers that we are. I hope that answers your question. That's great, Rosemary, um, and, and thank you for the comprehensive answer. I'd like to thank Bulani, James and Rosemary for taking part. It was a really interesting discussion. Um, I just have to say one of the other groups that I would be involved with would be Spark, are representing lone parents and they're another very discriminated group. And, uh, and it's, you know, and I see it both in Spark and in my work in Focus Ireland, that every group mentioned to your lone parents, migrants, 
people with disability and travelers are very much overrepresented in homelessness. And it's great to have been a part of this discussion about discrimination. As I said, Rosemary and Bulani and James, none of it was comfortable, but I don't think discussion about discrimination should ever be comfortable. Um, so I, I say appreciate your honesty in your discussions. And I think um, maybe Rory would like to come in and just close off this. And again, remember, if you want to look at an interesting um, movie tonight, you could cast push onto your screens and relax then. Okay, but now I'll say goodbye and I'll hand it over to somebody from um, from from the conference. Well, anyway, um, just to thank everyone for participating today. It's been an incredible day. Um, and I think, you know, from the start in terms of Manuel talking about financialization and highlighting the increased way in which investors are buying up uh, property, uh, not just in Ireland, but globally, it's really shows the challenge we face. And I think that, um, you know, it's welcome to see the housing minister set out, you know, the, a new plan or the um, at least the development of that plan. I think it's really important that we uh, that that plan is underpinned by a right to housing um, and also um, the key aspects that were set out today, including um, in particularly the plans to end homelessness, the issues in the last panel there around discrimination traveler accommodation, uh, people with a disability, uh, direct provision, migrants, ending that discrimination. Um, and I was really struck by uh, Saeja um, from the Y Foundation in Finland from her um, presentation where she set out that they're going to end homelessness in Finland within um, by 2027. And I see no reason why we can't have the ambition to end homelessness in Ireland as well within um, a relatively uh, short time frame in a number of years, but a real, and that needs to be set out as a real objective. Um, and I think that I thank again all our participants, everyone for being involved. Tomorrow, uh, we have another day of uh, how we can achieve affordable housing. Um, and of course, the discussion on the right to housing in the afternoon. And this evening, we have the screening of the push. So we look forward to uh, seeing you all then. And if you want to keep tweeting away, we're on hashtag home a human right. So thank you and we'll see you then.